Let's get peppy. Welcome to Pep 124. That's Pep or Planet Extra podcast. It's an offshoot of Planet America on the ABC Australia, which you can see on Friday at 8 p.m. on ABC News Channel iView, on Facebook at ABC Planet America, and on YouTube at the ABC In Depth Channel. On Pep, we cover the stuff that's too nerdy for TV. If you're listening, you can also see this podcast on Facebook and YouTube, where you will see Dr. Pepper himself, Dr. Dave Smith. Dr. Dave, tell us your grass hits. Hi, I am from the United States. <laughs> State Study Centre at the University of Sydney. I don't speak on behalf of either of those institutions, though, when I do PEP. When I do PEP, you are just getting me and my opinions. And by the way, if you use PEP to determine what day of the week it is, well, you'd be a bit confused (laughs) this week because we're not doing it on the Friday as we usually do concurrently with the show. Instead, we're doing it on Wednesday. That's correct. Today is Wednesday. Well done. You've passed the first test, Dave. Yep. Uh, You're you're probably overqualified to be president with that. (laughs) Um, The the, the next few weeks are going to be a bit weird, actually. It's not just this one. We got, uh, we got, yeah, right now is our Wednesday podcast, obviously. We're not going to have one on Friday. That's why we're doing it on Wednesday. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, <laughs> the uh, Next Wednesday, there'll be a, another one with Melina. will be next Wednesday. And then next Friday, not this Friday, next Friday, we are back on Friday. Yes, that we Friday. are. Um, then, at the, at, then the week after that, it gets even strange, not with us, but with Pine America because- <laughs> The week after that, what the FAQ ends, which means we then start doing two episodes of Planet America per week. Wow. Which we've been holding off because I feel like there should be at least five minutes on the ABC airwaves that don't involve me. <laughs> so as soon as what the FAQ oh, finishes, then we have two episodes of Planet America per week and the podcast. So there will be enough American politics for you, I feel, okay. at that point in time. Good. But that's what's coming up. So do not expect the podcast this Friday. The next one will be in a week's time with mm. Melina. Uh, are you grateful for anything? Yes. I saw this headline yes. that mammals have now been on Earth for 250 million years. You're grateful for mammals? And, well, uh, these <laughs> this group of scientists were estimating we've got exactly 250 million years left. Really? Yeah, How, yeah. How's that work? Well, I don't know. They, they just assume we're at the halfway point. Uh, it wasn't an assumption. There was a lot of very complicated modelling involved. Okay. But, yeah, they did basically say the planet will become uninhabitable for mammals in 250 yeah. million years' time because of continental plates uh, coming back together. Ah, uh, yes. They I said Pangaea is going to be reformed. So if yes. you've been waiting for that, uh, yeah, something called Super Pangaea is going to be reformed in 250 million years' time and all that clashing of plates is going to make things unfathomably hot for mammals. And I suppose what I'm grateful for is the fact that I won't be around then. <laughs> yes. No, I'm I- also grateful for the fact that I wasn't around in the beginning. You yeah. know, no one ever wants to get to the party early. Yeah, you certainly chose the right the yeah. right billion year period yes. to exist in, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, that's what I'm grateful for. Yeah, fair enough. Look, I'm grateful that someone has finally stood up to a geezer, any geezer. I am <laughs> sick of the geezers and on American politics, and someone finally stood up to one. It didn't get much coverage, so I'm not sure if you know about this. No. But, uh, uh, Judge Pauline Newman, have you heard of her? No. Nah. She is on the DC Court of Appeals and she was suspended this week. Right. She was suspended because she refused to undertake medical testing. <laughs> and the reason she needed to undertake medical testing is because people are very concerned about uh, her competence. Right. Guess how old she is? Uh, 98. Pretty good, 96. Wow. Those geezers are getting old. So are people concerned that someone's actually doing a weekend at Bernie's type stunt? I don't think there's a suggestion that she's actually yeah. dead. And so <laughs> when when they asked her, look, you've got to submit to a medical examination, yeah. someone was like uh, moving her head from side to side and say, no, yeah, I can't no, do that. No, it wasn't like a reflex test to see if she in fact has any reflexes. Right. It wasn't that. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was there, there, there were more mental tests. It's uh, look, she, the, the, the basic story is that, that – her colleagues had doubts about her. Right. And so uh, they, they there was a special three-judge committee yeah. assembled to investigate her. Yes. And they, they conducted 20 interviews and, and uh, quote, along with numerous emails sent by Judge Newman herself, provided overwhelming evidence that Judge Newman may, that Judge Newman may be experiencing significant mental problems, including memory loss, lack of comprehension, confusion, and an inability to perform basic tasks that she previously was able to perform with ease. Uh, so they then... 
then ordered that she consult with a neuro- neurologist yep. and undergo neurophysical, neuropsychological tests, and yep. she refused point blank no. to do it. So her colleagues voted to suspend her for wow. a year. Wow. Which president appointed her? Reagan. <laughs> okay. In 1984. Wow. <laughs> yes. Um, that the, Her colleagues said... Um, with no rational reason other than frustration over her own confusion, Judge Newman has threatened to have staff arrested, forcibly removed from the building, and fired. She accused staff of trickery, deceit, acting as her adversary, stealing her computer, stealing her <laughs> files, and depriving her of secretarial support. Wow. Uh, she says, we yeah. should hear what she has to say. Yes, she says, we should. She says, my concern is not only for the personal attacks on me, but for the nation's judiciary, already under stress. She was concerned after what happened to her, Quote, how can the public have confidence in the integrity of the judiciary? <laughs> <laughs> they always just worried about the, the public's view yes, of the institution. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get to that with Menendez. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's always the case. Uh, I reckon the public will soldier on, even without Judge Pauline Newman. Possibly. Between you and me. Yes. But um, just a little, like, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that someone stood up to a geezer finally. But honestly, geezers, if you're listening, and I know they are, everyone, yeah, yeah, everyone yeah. listens to Pep, especially the geezers, uh, just retire. Just retire. Honestly, the New York Times in, in their article about this lady talked about yes. Judge Wesley Brown, who died in 2012 mm. uh, and when he was 104, still in on the bench. Wow. And he used to hear cases with a tube under his nose feeding him oxygen. <laughs> I mean, come on. Just retire. Like, you're not that important. All these people think they're indispensable. They are not indispensable. Yes, he was uh, hearing cases in the most <laughs> metaphorical <laughs> yeah. of senses. Wow. Yeah, yeah. look, I, I, if I, I, I don't know, I'll probably change my mind by the time I get there, but at this point in time, I want to pull on my gravestone, I wasn't special and neither are you. You are not special. This judge is not special. No one is special. Stop thinking that you're <laughs> irreplaceable. You're not. You're only important to yourself. That's my takeaway. Okay. <laughs> anyway. That's excellent. I'm grateful for people standing up. <laughs> Wisconsin. We've got an update on Wisconsin, Dave. You didn't know this. This is something I'm just springing on you. Yes. No, um, I, I was not aware of yeah, we've updates on we, we, We've talked about the situation where uh, the Wisconsin legislature could impeach the Democrat judge. They uh, had this. I've already forgotten how to pronounce her name. Uh, Protosawitz. Yes, Protosawitz. I'm never going to forget it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they got the yeah they got this gerrymander so that yep. in, in Wisconsin so that the the basically the Republican legislature can't get voted out essentially. Yes. Yep. Uh, the Republican uh, 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 Wisconsin State Supreme Court was keeping them in. It was keeping that gerrymander in place. Yep. And then a Democrat won the balance of power, so to speak, on the yes. court. And so they were immediately about to overturn this gerrymander and therefore endanger the Republican legislature. The Republican legislature said, no, not so fast. We are, uh, we may well impeach you because yes. you said that you thought the map, that the clearly rigged maps were rigged. Yes. And so you were prejudging the question. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so we will impeach you. But, but at the same time, we may, while you can't hear cases when you're impeached, um, we can hold off the trial as long as we like. Yes. So potentially you could stay in limbo you until, until, that until we yes. yeah until we change. They didn't say that, but this is what yeah, other yeah, people yeah, are yeah. saying. Yep. Until um that they could she could be held in limbo until uh, after they r- draw the new maps of twenty twenty four. Yep. Okay, so that was um, that was where we're at. Yes. Now yeah, yeah. The, the update is I yes. just found out this week. This is an update in my world. <laughs> it's yeah, not, not, yes. not new news. Okay, right, I just yep. discovered. Yep. I just found out this week, why that's not going to happen. Oh. And that, and there's a very good reason why that's not going why to happen. Why is that not going to happen? Now, we already knew that if Protasiewicz resigns, the government, who is democratic, will yes. appoint her replacement. Absolutely. We already yes. knew that. Yep. But this is what I did not know. Oh. According to Wisconsin law, yep. there can be no more than one Supreme Court seat on the ballot on any given year. Ah. And there are already... I definitely didn't know this. Yeah, yeah. There are already seats scheduled for re-election every year from 2025 to 2030. Wow. So if Protosawitz resigns yes, yeah, yeah. and is replaced by a Democrat, by the governor, yeah. then this, there will be a special election put in a queue yes. at the end of that process, which is 2031. Wow. So 
Evers, who is a Democrat, the governor, will yeah. appoint a Democrat judge for the next eight years. Yes. <laughs> so, so they are not going to be, they're not going to want that to happen. Yes. So for that reason, they're not going to want to piss Protasiewicz off to the point where she resigns. Yes. So I think the, the limbo option ain't yeah. going to happen. Not going to happen. For that reason. So now you don't hear that a lot, but like the, so I just want you to know that there's a lot of scaremongering about this. I think rightly so. Yes. But in this case, when you look at the, the fine detail on the law, I don't think it's going to happen. That is that a reason. very, sensible law. Hmm. Why don't I say very Wisconsin law? <laughs> well, dude, Wisconsin is historically hmm. renowned as the home of government that is self-consciously clean and rational. Hmm. This was the whole uh, Wisconsin thing. So back in the late 19th century, a lot of states were governed by systems of party patronage. Hmm. Uh, and some still are, like New Jersey, which we will get to uh, yeah. before very long. Wisconsin was really notable as one of the states where there was this huge push for clean government, so for impartially appointed civil service and a general sort of faith in science and rationality. Now, I mean, in, in a state that was very deeply religious at the same time, uh, but this was embodied in all kinds of things to do with Wisconsin government, including in the university system, right? The, the whole University of Wisconsin system was based on something called the Wisconsin Idea, which was all based on this kind of faith in science and progress and rationality. And that's why we've often seen um, with Wisconsin that it has these kinds of clean government innovations. And if there's anywhere that's going to have a fairly sensible law on the books uh, about this sort of thing, yeah, I would say it's Wisconsin. Wisconsin. No, not to say that Wisconsin's politics have always been perfectly pure and rational, right? This is the state that gave us tail gunner Joe McCarthy, after all. <laughs> so, you know, no state is uh, is always completely clean and, and great in its, uh, in its politics, but Wisconsin is one of the states that actually tried to, really seriously tried to institutionalise good government. And this is actually part of what, is so frustrating about what the current Republican state legislature is Absolutely, doing with yes. their bullshit gerrymanders yeah, and all yeah. the rest of it. Like they're they're not just. I mean, yeah, a state like North Carolina has a has a yes, has yeah. a long history of corruption. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Wisconsin has a history of being one of the one of the good states. It does, and it's, it's a shame for them to bugger it up. It does. Yeah. Another another problem that Wisconsin has, though, and this was very well documented a few years ago in Kathy Kramer's book, "The Politics of Resentment," mm. which really makes my, Wisconsin a microcosm of the whole country is it's got a savage urban rural divide mm. and so she spent a lot of time in rural Wisconsin listening to people's grievances and it was basically a belief that tax dollars were sucked from rural areas to vanish into the black holes of Milwaukee and uh, Madison mm. there was the, the sort of normal sense of cultural resentment that the uh, you know that that all the attention in the state is uh, is centered on these major cities, and yeah, this this sense that uh, the the rural state is not being listened to. And she was writing this in the context of the Scott Walker recall um, election, which people in she's a professor at University of Wisconsin, and she was saying that people in her circles were expecting Walker to get recalled uh, uh, easily. It was kind of a shock when he didn't, and that was why she wrote this book, which in retrospect, was uh, basically presaging what was going to happen with Trump. So very good, worth checking out. I'll put it on the list. On the list? Yes. Okay. Uh, does this does this count as a tangent treehouse? Uh, well, I don't have the sting made yet, so okay. let, let's just call it that. Tangent treehouse. Wisconsin edition. <laughs> Praise of Wisconsin edition. Uh, if you want to see the book list, uh, look in the show notes on the uh on the uh, either Facebook yes. or YouTube video. And another important book about Wisconsin from many, many years earlier is um, uh, Michael Paul Rogan's book, um, uh, The Intellectuals and McCarthy. Is which that is, on well, the list as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, which is all about the uh, the election of McCarthy. And um, that's a very good book because it argues that populism in America is not some spasm of irrationality and suddenly moralised politics. He said, American politics has always been deeply moralised. 
Okay. Okay. Well, you can read that at your leisure. I'll still be reading Michelle uh, 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 Bamford. Yes. <laughs> yes. Maria Bamford. Maria Bamford. Um, yes. Uh, let's get into the content, though. We w- Let's start with Congress. We, the shutdown, obviously, is always the top story at the moment. Yep. You got some updates on that? Yes. So the Senate has come up with a bipartisan resolution. It cleared its first procedural hurdle mm. tonight, uh, 77 to 19. Uh, which would be a six-week funding measure. Yep. And one of the major things about that was that it would make $6 billion in aid available for Ukraine until 2025. Mm-hmm. Uh, also would have guaranteed disaster relief, which is a pretty important function of the federal government. But I think it's very unlikely that this is going to go anywhere in the House, given that the House is very much focused on long-term appropriations. Mm. In fact, Kevin McCarthy actually managed to get House Republicans to vote in a majority uh, on a measure to move a long-term appropriations bill forward. But that had money for Ukraine in it. You can't have that. So guess who voted against it? Well, yes, Marjorie Taylor Greene. This this goes to what we were talking about last week. Yes. When when you were saying how it was surprising to see Marjorie Taylor Greene being not the voice of destruction in this area. No. So give us some time. No, she's had a few good weeks as <laughs> yeah. not the voice of destruction. But, yeah. uh, but uh, no, yeah, well, this has actually started. This the Marjorie Taylor Greene with the Ukraine thing actually started yep. even before then. Because like, we were talking about the second procedural rule to begin debate on the defence bill last week, yes. last podcast, about how that, that got shot down. Yep. And that was, I believe, the that, that's now three times that's happened under McCarthy. Um, the vote to begin debate, <laughs> the, the vote for a rule to begin debate being <laughs> shut down, and that hadn't happened and since 2003, I believe, or 2002, under Dennis Hastert. So you, had, you had to go back to oh, pedophile Dennis speakers. Hastert. Imagine, <laughs> yeah. imagine being the yeah, yeah the first since Dennis Hastert yeah. is never a label that you want attached to yourself about Absolutely. anything. Absolutely, yes. yes. Uh, uh, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, as I said, I already just mentioned the pedophile word. You can read, look him up if you'd like. Yes, <laughs> but uh, the um, um, yes, but the the, the since Dennis Hastert, there, there have been none of these uh, votes to. To, for a rule to begin debate being shot down. And McCarthy's had three in a year. Yes. And the second one, the the second defence one, which we referred to, we didn't know who had voted against against it. I asked, were they the same five people? Yep. No, this is the fun bit. McCarthy actually thought he had the votes because oh, he twisted the yes. arm yeah, yeah, yeah. of two of them to step down, but then they were replaced by two others, one of whom was Marjorie Taylor Greene. So she she popped her head up ah, last week, right. right? But then she decided to really sort of take centre stage, and she's really doubled down. And uh, she has um, she said that she's not going to vote for anything now. She's yeah. a hard no hard on en- no. any package uh-huh. that involves Ukraine funding. Mm. Uh, furthermore, she actually added something to that as well this weekend. She's yeah. also a hard no on anything which doesn't uh, strip the Justice Department of its ability to fund special counsel investigations. Wow. Now, um, <laughs> she didn't announce the special investigation, special counsel investigation th- uh, thing the same day that Trump said yeah. that they should shut the government down unless the budget <laughs> defunded Jack Smith's investigation wow. into him. So that might be a coincidence. Yeah. Maybe it's not. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> I still think she's the front runner to be Trump's vice president. I think she's trying to be Trump's vice president. I'm not. I'm not convinced that Trump will choose her. But uh, I do know that Melina wants to talk a lot about that in the next podcast. So, oh, okay. So, so yeah, that's yeah, coming because yeah. I've actually got. I, I, I don't want to spoil, but I've got a theory that. Marjorie Taylor Greene, or one of her supporters, and so let's face it, Marjorie Taylor Greene yes, yeah. is doing some is in the middle of some skullduggery at the moment to try and uh, nobble her opposition. Right, yes. We'll get to that though. Yes. Next podcast. That's a teaser for you. Okay. But um but yeah, whether she's chosen or not, she definitely wants to be. Yes. And she's definitely campaigning for it. Yep. Hard. Mm. And at the moment she's campaigning by been a massive nuisance for Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. And so she's a hard no, which means that he doesn't have many other Republicans he can Lean on who, yes. who, who can he can afford no. to say no before nothing gets up. Um, okay, so w- w- now the last I heard with the house, tell me if there's something more recent than this. The last I heard from the house, Kevin McCarthy was was basically being led by the nose by Matt Gates and was yep. Ma- Matt Gates wanting to do these individual 
these individual appropriations yes, bills. Yeah, and so yeah, that's yeah. why he is doing the, the 12 appropriations bills rather yeah. than omnibus or a continuing resolution. They're just doing one at a time. Are they still trying to do that? Do we know? I think think so but i'm not sure i haven't seen anything more about that okay the other thing which i which i the last i heard because i'm, I'm asking dags i'm a few days behind as always the last i heard was that there were um that kevin that not kevin mccarthy but some of the like mike lawler we played mike lawler being very angry in the last podcast he's very, a moderate republican very angry man <laughs> very angry man mike lawler and a couple of other moderates are working Secretly, well, not so secretly because it's in the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. With Democrats to uh, arrange their own potential bill, yeah, which yeah, McCarthy yeah. is is re- renouncing. Yes, but they might have what they call a discharge petition, which is working right. around yes, McCarthy, yeah, yeah. which is another way for McCarthy to lose a speakership. So this will be the good old problem solvers caucus. This would be yes, yes. which is for those of you who don't know, is a bipartisan group. Mm. in the Senate that involves both Republicans and Democrats. And it's mm. actually one of the bigger Republican groupings mm. um, in the House, but they've been marginalised a bit recently. But this might be their time to shine. It might be. Like, basically, like they, don't, they don't need many. Was it three, four, whatever? Yeah. Um, uh, Republicans and the Democrats yes. can just go behind uh, McCarthy's back yep. and, just, and just table their own yep. bill, which has been... It's somewhere in a committee buried buried away yeah and uh then get the votes and that would be that's essentially that's as good as a, a vote of no confidence in McCarthy. it is yeah so that he would then be in a lot of trouble but um the but it would stop the shut well it wouldn't stop the shutdown because it's probably too late to stop the shutdown now mm. but it would make it a very short shutdown yes. if they did that yeah and i should say matt gates is totally awake to this as well like yeah. like the, the quote from him is the threat is he said, this is, this is the only threat he's identified to his plans. <laughs> the threat is that a few liberal or moderate Republicans say, we don't want to do the single subject bill, so we're just going to go sign what's called discharge petition and then just move that thing like shit through a goose. So the, go- the goose may be guzzling yeah. <laughs> some laxative as we speak. Yes. Yeah. Um, anything else that, that's going on recently in that that we know, need to know about? No. No? I just want to just, just say just one little thing about this, which is yes. – um, Looking at this from a from a policy perspective, yeah, uh, which is a bit of a strange thing to do. I know, I know. I I, I I feel a little bit like Judge Pauline Newman saying that, <laughs> but let, let's just. I'm not senile. Let's just for a moment pretend there's a policy a, a, a policy perspective. Okay, here, right? yes. They're supposedly worried about spending. That's what the, there's a lot of talk yes. about at the moment. Yeah, like yeah, they're yeah. too much spending, right? From the Freedom Caucus guys. That's yes. what they're saying. Yeah, uh, they're trying to save America from its debt. And I understand those kinds of thoughts. As I've said before yeah, many yeah. times on this podcast, mm. I was sympathetic when the Tea Party started and they were talking about fiscal responsibility. I said, I wasn't a Tea Party, yeah, but I thought, yeah. I can see where these guys are coming from. You know, like they're like, like there is a lot of spending going on. I get that. I know you disagree. That was pretty naive, Jess. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> But I became a lot less sympathetic when I saw what they did when they were in power. Yes. A few years later under yeah, Trump yeah. and then they were spending even more. But let's take a step back. Let me let me just, just explain why this is all posing and bullshit. Mm-hmm. Okay? This is the more For those of you who need convincing <laughs> at this point. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, there are two kinds of spending. There is discretionary spending yep. and there's mandatory spending. All they talk about is discretionary yes. spending. All right? In reality, discretionary spending has gone down as a percentage of GDP Mm -hmm. over the last 40 years, and it continues to go down. Uh, That is basically all the forms of spending that you, uh, that when we talk about spending that you know about, like, you know, like spending on various programs, spending on SNAP, spending Mm. all that kind of stuff. Then what they call mandatory spending is stuff which is just automatic, like like Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, the stuff where, where there's not a particular portion allotted for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just however many people claim exactly. it is, is what yes. we pay. Yeah, right? and you're committed to that by law. Yeah, and yes. and that has gone up in the last 40 years from 10% of GDP to 15% mm-hmm. of GDP. Yep. And uh, the um, uh, if you're n- basically if you're um, if you're not talking about Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security, you're not serious about cutting budgets. Right, like now, now you can argue whether whether they need to cut them or not. Yeah, yeah. Like that is that is a legitimate argument. Yeah, yeah. At this point in time, like the uh, like like some say, for instance, with Social Security, there's no need to cut that. All you need to do is just is just tax everyone. Social Security taxes at the moment yeah. that they have a cut off. Yes. 
um, that's fine. But I'm just saying, if you're actually talking about spending, yeah, yeah, don't talk about some program to fund like some experiment on badges or something. Talk about Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid because that's where the money is. Mm. If you're not talking about that, you're not talking about cutting. Cutting no. the budget. And of course, they're not kind of talking about that. No. And Those are popular programs. Yeah. yeah I've got numbers right here. Um, there was an AP NORC poll tw- uh, this year. Yep. 60% of those surveyed say the government spends too much. Mm. That's pretty typical kind of answer. But when they nominated 16 different policy areas, there's only one area where the majority of people said there was too much spending. And you know what it is. I'm guessing welfare. No, nah, foreign aid. It's always foreign aid. Oh, right. Every okay. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time it's one of these polls, it's yeah, always yeah. foreign aid. And foreign aid is yeah, less than 1% of the yes. budget, obviously. But often estimated by people as being somewhere between 10 and 25% of the budget. Yeah. Yes. And, it, and 69% of people said the government was spending too much on that, of course. Um, but uh, but the rest of them, I'll just race through them. This is, this is the percentage of people who said they were spending too much. Mm-hmm. Assistance to big cities, 41%. Spa- space exploration 39 percent the military 29 percent environment 25 percent law enforcement 23 percent border security 23 percent drug rehabilitation 20 percent scientific research 20 percent assistance for the poor 18 percent child care assistance 16 percent education 12 percent infrastructure that's roads and bridges 11 percent you know now none of those matter yeah but even so people don't think they spend too much on yeah, them. Yeah, you yeah. know the ones i didn't mention mm. I, I, i've saved them to the end Healthcare. 63 sorry 16% said said there was too much spending mm. 63% said there was too little spending wow. medicare yeah. 10% said there was too much spending. Mm. 58% said there was too little spending. Yeah. Social Security, 7% said there mm. was too much spending. 62% said there were too little there was too yeah, little yeah. spending. And that is the reason why anyone who's, who's talking about, oh, we need to save money, we need to save money, is full of shit. Now, ironically, <laughs> I think there is too much spending on healthcare. You know the reason for that? Because the United States is the one government in the world that will not <laughs> negotiate over drug prices. Wow, until now. It does not actually need to spend as much as it does on healthcare. Now, I mean, more spending on healthcare would be good if it was being spent on productive things, but at the mm. moment, the United States is spending way more on healthcare if you consider private and public spending together than any other advanced industrial democracies with worse health outcomes. So it's actually true. They are spending too much on healthcare. Well, there we go. Dave's a tea party. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> no. <laughs> Quite All right. uh, I assume we're finished with Congress? Yes. Let's move on to our favourite person in Congress to this week then, which is Bob Menendez. Bob Menendez. Take it away, Dave. Yes. So Bob Menendez, who's a senator from New Jersey, has been in the Senate since 2006. Yes. But his political career spans 49 years. What was he doing before then? I was quite shocked then? to read this. Oh, various levels of New Jersey government. Okay. He's only 69 years old, so, you know, wow. yeah. he's into it um, from the age of 20. Now, mm. What Bob Menendez is most known for (laughs) is he's the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and he is basically everything has got to be like it was in 1986. Like Mm. uh, any US foreign policy that deviates from that, he's against it. Mm. So any relaxation especially of uh, punitive measures towards Cuba. Oh, yeah. he's against that. His parents came from uh, Cuba. Uh, you know, any move away from bipartisan support for Israel, he's against that. Um, very, very committed to America's most kind of um, traditional relationships. One of them, it turns out, he's particularly committed to is Egypt. Yes, it does turn that out. Yes. yes. <laughs> so Egypt has for a long time been one of the biggest recipients of United States military aid. Mm. Um, Second only, well, usually second only to Israel, but over the last 20 years also second to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm. Um, Now, US military aid for Egypt goes all the way back to the agreement that was signed uh, between Israel and Egypt in 1978, I think it was, Egypt being the first Arab power to actually sign a peace agreement with uh, Israel, acknowledge its right to exist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, the, yeah, the, the US has been supplying considerable military aid to uh, Egypt ever since. In 
2011 as part of the Arab Spring. Uh, Hosni Mubarak, who had been running the show in Egypt for, oh, God, I don't know how many, 30 or 40 years or something, uh, something like that, was ousted. Uh, when democratic elections were held, the you know they were held pretty suddenly and the group that was most ready to contest them was a political party linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, who subsequently won. They were then ousted in a coup by uh, Fatah al-Sisi, but the United States did not refer to it as a coup. Because if they had referred to it as a coup, they would have had to stop military aid to Egypt. Okay. And they did not want to stop military aid to Egypt. They quite liked the fact that the Muslim Brotherhood had been removed from government. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong, I probably wouldn't want to live in a country governed by the Muslim Brotherhood, Mm. but this was a bit of a disaster as far as democracy in the region went because the message was the United States will support a military-backed dictatorship that supports the US over a democratically elected government that it finds that that it doesn't like. That surprised people in the region. Um, <laughs> you called me naive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> yes. it didn't. Uh, it didn't surprise anybody, but yeah. that was it. It reinforced what yes. people already uh, sure. what people what people already thought. Yeah. Um, let's let's put it this way: it wasn't very Obama. No, no, no. But <laughs> yes, it was yes. that. That absolutely yeah. was Obama at the same time. Yes, it was. Yes. It, it was the Obama reality, not yes. the Obama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was not Cairo theory. speech, Obama. This yeah. was we're sending money. <laughs> to Cairo, yeah. Uh, Obama. Yeah. Okay, so support for Egypt, yes. uh, support for Egypt's military dictatorship has been a pretty bipartisan element of US foreign policy, and that brings us to Bob. Now, the other thing that Bob is known for is getting indicted for yeah, things. Yeah, I yes. thought that was going to be the first thing yes, you said. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, in 2017... Well, no. Oh, he, oh hang on. He hang died on. it in 2015. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll let you continue. Okay. But if we're going to talk about Bob Menendez's history of corruption, okay, yes. we need to start before 2017. Okay, okay. okay I'll let you take 2017. But yeah. first, we need to mention why people, why the investigators were looking into Bob Menendez in the first place. Yes. They've had an eye on him for a while. Okay. Since 2012. Take it away. And the reason why, you'll yes. see why I'm so keen on this one. Yeah, yeah is they began investigating in 2012 when they were tipped off that Bob Menendez was taking trips to the Dominican Republic to have sex with underage prostitutes. Mm. That's when they started investigating Bob Menendez. And they kept on investigating for a while. And while they were investigating him, then new allegations came up, which you can now talk about. No, you keep going. Keep going? Yes. Okay, all right. Well, in in 2015, yes. he was indicted over bribery charges yes. r- relating to a friend of his who was an ophthalmologist named Solomon Melgan. Mm. Uh, the indictment alleged that the, Mel- Melgan basically was a, a massive Medicare uh, fraudster. Yes. Like we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars here. Yep. Um, the uh, and I, I can say that without alleged because he was convicted of it. He was eventually, yes. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Menendez tried to intervene in the investigations yep. into Melgan. He, he basically was literally trying to mess with the um, U.S. attorney who was who was involved in the prosecution. Yes, yeah. Um, and in return, Melgan provided Menendez Menendez with luxury vacations, golf outings, campaign donations, and private jet flights. Yes. Always private jet flights. What is it with these guys in oh, private jet they flights? They just love it. They're addicted to it. They really do. Anyway. Yeah. Um, now, I should say, none of what I just said was disputed. No. Even by Menendez. No. They, 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 they completely accepted that Menendez was messing around with the US attorney. Yeah. They completely accepted that he was paid all the things that I just said. Yeah. What they were disputing was that it was a quid pro quo. Yes. They were, they were just friends. They were just friends, and Menendez was trying to help his friend. We've seen a lot of this recently. <laughs> and, and his friend was just trying to help Menendez, who's also a friend. Yeah. It's basically like- the, Sometimes the, you don't want to have to go to Newark Airport to fly somewhere. Totally. It's essentially just Ross and Rachel, but with private jets. Yeah. That's what it was. Just friends. Yes. And a, and a chimp somewhere along the way. Yeah. And, um, um, anyway, worth yes. noting, by the way, it's, it's, uh, it's in 2015 he was getting charged. Mm. Democrats actually rallied around him mm. in 2015. Okay. They actually kind of closed ranks. Yeah. Um, Did anyone go against them or not? I can't remember. Yeah. But they actually – and I, I don't think they were particularly – Supportive, no. like it wasn't going to be their number one cause. No, nah, but it was innocent until proven guilty. It was. They yeah, they did yeah. actually close around. I'm okay. trying to remember. Was this before or after Democrats 
to, I th- this is before. This is before Al Franken. Is this that before what you're Al Franken? Yes. yes. This is before yeah, yeah. Al Franken. So Al Franken uh, was really his ouster was really part of the Me Too movement, which is a couple of years later. And I think that's when Democrats actually started to see in-group policing as an important thing to do, because that was what, in their eyes, differentiated them from Republicans who wouldn't do anything about Trump. Can I just do a second, a second, very short tangent treehouse for a second? Yes, absolutely. You mentioned Al Franken. This is something I've been thinking about for a while. Yes, it occurred to me yeah. that I, I think I think most people, in hindsight, yeah. say that Al Franken shouldn't have resigned. Right? The uh, in terms of the I hear a lot of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You yeah. might disagree, whatever, but yeah, just yeah. in terms of like the allegations that were that were against him at the time, compared to. The other allegations that are flying around and, and yeah. what, what the bar has been set since Al yes. Franken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Al Franken seems to be the person who who paid the highest price for the smallest apparent offence yeah. in terms of the context of, of these kinds of allegations, yes. right? Um, if Al Franken had not – if that had not happened at that particular time yeah. and Al Franken or Al Franken had held firm or whatever, yes. I wonder – if Al Franken would have run for president in 2020. He may have done. And the reason I say that is because Al Franken would have been the perfect opponent for Donald Trump in, yeah. in, in 2020. And Al Franken is not 150 years old. No. And a lot of the problems that Democrats are currently having, they would not be having if Al Franken had run for president. There you go. I'll just, 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 just the Al Franken future that never happened. Yeah, just like you know, the sliding doors of that particular, yeah, that particular situation. I mean, I mean, this is all. There's so much speculation there. Who knows? Yes, yeah. There's, you know, that's that's very much alternative history. But yeah, you know, just something just occurred to me. Yeah. Like he would have been the perfect opponent for Trump. Mm, yeah. He was moderate yeah. in the same way that Joe Biden was moderate. Yes, yeah. He appealed to the same voters that Joe Biden appealed to. Yes. But at the same time, he was a much, much better candidate than Joe Biden was. Certainly a lot funnier. Yeah, and he and intentionally, he, and he would have been the only person who would be able to deal with Trump as Trump in, when Trump's doing Trump shit. Yes, yeah, and would have rolled with it with no problems whatsoever. Mm, yeah, but anyway, that's that's that, that's enough. That tantrum tra- house. I was just going to say to finish off my, my my little bit there about the the 2015 indictment. Yes, that the that. No one disputed those terms. No. But at the exact same point in time when yes. that when that court case was happening, there was another court yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. Where the Supreme Court with the McDonald case, where Supreme Court defined down what corruption was. That's right. And and essentially from at that point until then, bribery had a fairly logical definition. But yes. after that, bribery was when it was defined as when you take money mm. to perform a task that is part of your job and specifically part of your job. Yes. And you can demonstrate a direct causal link. So, yeah. so it's, doing favours is not enough. No. It has to be part of your job description. Yep. So if you corruptly do something out of your job description, <laughs> that's not bribery anymore. Yeah, yeah. It has to be part of your actual job description. So in this case with Menendez, he was leaning on the US attorney, which is not part of his <laughs> job description. So there was absolutely no way he was going to be found guilty yes. of uh, of corruption. And that's exactly what happened. He was yeah. let off for that reason. Yep. And there is a there is a punchline to this, which I'm saving for the end. Um, I, you, I mean, you might spoil it. Uh, you might not even know what I'm talking about. But th- I'll just save the punchline on this particular prosecution to we get to the end of this piece. So why don't okay. you continue on from there? Yeah. So in 2017, he gets off. Yeah. Um, yes. uh, was, that was declared a mistrial, wasn't it? it was, first it was a hung jury and then it was a mistrial. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he gets off in yeah. 2017 yes. and then sort of almost immediately afterwards decides that he, he wants to get some more stuff mm. in exchange for <laughs> services that may or may not be related to his official duties. Within two weeks of him getting off, yes. he was going out with this unemployed lady called Nadine. That's right. Who became his partner in crime. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. So yes. Bob Menendez <laughs> doesn't mess around. That's what the people of New Jersey <laughs> like about him. Um, so the current uh, thing that he's been indicted for is, yeah, she was a conduit to these three businessmen, yep. these Egyptian businessmen. Yep. Yep. Um, he has not been charged with bribery. No. He's been charged with basically being on the receiving end of a conspiracy to uh, to bribery. And this is where it starts to get complicated. But- I'll just, just say the charges. Conspiracy yes. to commit bribery, conspiracy to commit honest services fraud, and conspiracy to commit extortion under colour of official right. Yes. Yeah. So we'll get to exactly what Bob Menendez was getting for all this stuff uh, in a second. But mm. just in terms of the, the three Egyptian business people, yep. not only were they enriching themselves, they were promoting Egypt's interest. Yes. So a 
lot of this comes down to the fact that Bob Menendez is in a very powerful position as the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Was he putting the thumb on the scale for Egypt and yep. uh, Egypt's administration. That's, that, I think that's what a lot of it is going to come down to, and that could get very complicated. And Menendez is already starting to invoke his record of things that he criticised uh, Egypt for. But let's get to the fun it, stuff. Oh, yeah, just before we do that, it, yes. is, it, is it a potential problem that, yeah. like what you were just saying before about his history of Egypt, could, could yeah, he yeah. use as a defence, I've been a flunky for Egypt forever? Well, no, he's saying he's been a he's been a tough. Creep oh, okay. <laughs> he hasn't Egypt. chosen that path. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, okay, but, go on. Yeah, yeah, okay. But in terms of what Bob Menendez got, mm. uh, he got a very nice car. <laughs> he did. He allegedly got a lot of cash, which investigators found at his house. Yes. He immediately went on the defensive about that and said, no, the reason I had half a million in cash lying mm. around is because of my family's history in Cuba. Yes. Where you've always got to be ready to flee from persecution. Sorry, let me read the quote. Yes. Uh, let's give the man his due here. Yeah. Um, uh, for 30 years, I have withdrawn thousands of dollars in cash from my personal savings account, yes. which I have kept for emergencies. And because of the history of my family facing confiscation in Cuba. Yeah. Now, this may seem old-fashioned, but these were monies drawn from my personal savings account based on the income that I have lawfully derived over those 30 years. Yeah. Yes. And once again, his constituents in New Jersey are like, damn right, I've got half my life savings under my pillow as well. Just to be clear, we're talking half a million dollars here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. It is it's quite, a lot of, quite a lot of cash. Yeah. Yes. And we also should, should point out that Bob Menendez is not from Cuba. No. Bob Menendez was born in America. Yeah, yeah, his parents. And he, and he was born in America before Castro even came to power. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So I'm not sure what family history he he's talking about. He does play the, the Cuba card. <laughs> yes. But the best bit about all of this is, and you've no doubt seen this if you've seen any of the headlines, is the gold bars. The gold bars. He got a lot of gold bars yeah. and yeah. also... Uh, these mean-spirited prosecutors have pointed out that they found in his Google searches how much is a kilo of gold worth. Twice. <laughs> Twice. And both times came directly after meetings with one of these guys. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Look, there are all sorts of reasons why you'd want to know the answer to that question. Maybe he yeah. was playing trivia that night. And Maybe. that was, you know, he was cheating at trivia. I, I, I gotta say though, but both times, yes, the kilos of gold yeah. came from like the the gold, the, the, yeah, the gold bars came from the same guy, which yeah. is this Diabetes guy, right? Yes, How yeah, do you yeah. say that, Diabetes or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, that guy seems to keep on giving them gold. The other yeah. guys are giving cash. Yes, the other guys yeah, yeah, are yeah, paying yeah. mortgages, give them cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this guy keeps on like this guy's like this, a Bond villain. He's guy. obsessed with gold. Like, wouldn't that annoy you if you're corrupting with a guy who's just who's just always giving you gold? It's like, oh shit, here's Dibies again. Well, There's yeah, a bloody oh, doubloon. Yeah, yeah. Blackbeard here is turned yeah, up yeah. with the gold. <laughs> I mean, like, how just, the fuck am I supposed to carry this? Yeah, just give me cash, dude. Yeah, just give me. I tell you what, you don't need to search. Like in a way, the FBI can trace the yes. price of, and yeah. that's money. You know the price of money; it's written on the paper. Yeah. Just give me some cash. What's with the gold? That's right. It really give me the. So shits. when you get involved in a conspiracy <laughs> like this, <laughs> yes. just bear things like that in mind. Like, yes. is there some asshole who's going to keep giving you gold? Oh, oh sorry, sorry. I, just, just, I forgot when we talked about the the, the, the yeah. envelopes of cash. By yes. the way, I yeah, mean yeah. we're a bit all over the place. We're having fun. That's fine. Yeah. With the envelopes of cash that yes. we talked about before, they found yeah. the half a million dollars, yes. right? Um, that he's saving from yes. because of Cuba. Yes. Right? <laughs> okay. yeah. Remember that? The fingerprints of the guy who gave him the yes. cash is yeah, all yeah. over the envelope. Yes. So he, he didn't change the envelope. No. They found the envelope with the cash in it, yes. with the fingerprints on it and the DNA. Okay, it's the driver who yeah, gave yeah, him yeah. the envelope. Yeah. They got the driver's fingerprints and the DNA of the guy yes. who the cash came from is all over the cash. Yeah. And he's still using this line. But anyway. Okay. That's right. So yeah, there's a lot of things about this that look pretty clear cut. It's, but, it's a lot of fun. But once again... It's going to come down to these technicalities mm. around bribery, yeah. around things like quid pro quo. So mm. I saw an article, I'm blanking on his name, but it's by a University of Pennsylvania law professor who has been involved in corruption cases for many years, mm. and he was looking at the kinds of arguments that uh, Menendez and his lawyers are likely to use, and some of them are pretty complicated, but um, one of them is about the meaning of official Duties, of course, and which is a key thing because yeah, it's yeah. McDonald ruling. And yes. we've talked about this before. There's actually a level of sort of ceremonial stuff. So, for example, mm. 
one of the things that Menendez is alleged to have done is basically invited Egyptian officials along to a lot of fancy ceremonies. Yes. And there's a question about whether that uh, actually comes under official duties Mm. or not. I mean, it's Mm. definitely official in the sense that we understand official, but there have been court cases suggesting that that doesn't get included in uh, bribery. So, although, although he was paid for some of these meetings. He was paid. For, yeah, just directly for some of these definitely meetings. Definitely paid for yeah. uh, some of these meetings. But yeah. once again, this comes back to this official duties definition. Yeah. Um, there's the fact that so there's no underlying crime of bribery. Instead, they've got to prove conspiracy. Um, they've, they've got things like when a certain payment was made and his partner was told about it, mm. she texted Christmas in January. That's right. Exclamation mark. Now, is that going to be good enough for a jury to prove beyond reasonable doubt? It'd be good enough for me, but you know, <laughs> uh, is it where, where's this going to be tried in New Jersey? I don't know. Mm. I do not know. Yeah, I mean, they, they all they they all exist in New Jersey, yes. so you would yeah, think yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. So anyway, the, it you know, bribery as we now know is a pretty tricky thing mm. to actually uh, prove. By the way, part of the context of this is in. 2015, Washington Post said that New Jersey was America's most corrupt state. I think by a factor of two to one. And that was just because of Bob Menendez. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say like that without getting into, you know, needless uh, stereotypes <laughs> promoted by the Sopranos and things like that. New Jersey has <laughs> a very long history of party patronage. Like yeah. it's, it's one of the states that was l- far less reformed. I mean, New York is the same, far less reformed uh, than a lot of these other clean government states. New Jersey was never really had a clean government movement. Like, it's always it been... It's anti-Wisconsin. It's, yeah, yeah, it's always been a, uh, a party patronage state. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to move off the legalities, unless you've got more to say about that. Uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm all right. I'd like, to, I'd like to talk about the facts of the... Of the uh, like the, the the facts, the allegations. Okay, because I do want to talk about the the political fallout. Okay, let let, let me talk about the facts, the yes, allegations yeah. a bit more, and yep. then then we'll go into the political okay. fallout. Okay, so I just want to fill in the gaps here, just for the people who who this story is actually a bit confusing. So for people who who either haven't spent hours reading about this or just have heard bits and pieces, you want to know the full story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you get the full story you, on Pep. You always get the full story You won't story get correct Pep. pronunciations. No, This no. is not pronunciation extra podcast, it but you will not. get the full story. <laughs> it is. Okay. So we talked about how a couple of weeks after after um, he got off his charge, previous charge, he met this Nadine. Yes. Lady Nadine Aslanian. She'd been facing – she was unemployed. She was facing foreclosure on her home. And she, and then she met uh, Menendez and immediately began dating her. She founded her own consulting business at that moment <laughs> called Strategic International Business Consultants. <laughs> Has no online footprint whatsoever. That is fantastic. It's not clue, not clear who its clients are, but it yeah, exists. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there, there were three guys who are all buddies with each other who we described before, yeah. um, who feature prominently in the dealings from now on. First is this Fred Dybys guy. He is a New Jersey developer. He was a longtime fundraiser for Menendez. Yes, and he'd been charged with bank fraud in 2018. So, yep. mwah, perfect guy for Menendez. <laughs> perfect pal. In 2021, it was time for a new U.S. attorney. He's still charged with bank fraud. Okay, yep. this, the bank fraud charges have been going for ages. Yes, um, the Santas can be influential on yeah, yeah. on who the U.S. attorney is is uh, is chosen to yep. be. The new U.S. attorney, but Biden's choosing a new U.S. attorney for New Jersey. Menendez, prosecutors say, badly wanted it to be someone who would go easy on diabetes. Mm. Uh, he interviewed another mate of his, Philip Salinger, and urged him explicitly to go easy on diabetes. Salinger said he'd probably have to recuse himself from the diabetes case because yeah. you know, the, his mates with Menendez and yeah, Menendez yeah. telling him to go easy. Um, Menendez said, well, I'm not going to recommend you for the post then. But then <laughs> Salinger told a Menendez advisor that he might not have to recuse after all. Mm. And the advisor told Menendez that. So then he did recommend Salinger for the post and he was confirmed. But then Salinger recused himself anyway, which pissed Menendez off. Oh, I can imagine. But nevertheless, Davies appreciated Menendez Menendez's work, and that's when he gave him a bunch of gold bars <laughs> worth four hundred thousand dollars. He gave him to Nadine, who was at that point in time married to uh, oh, to dear. Menendez, um, and then she sold them, and that led to <laughs> to uh, to the, the, the bit which I've already referred to in the dime. I won't read the quote because we've already referred to it, which is literally when they were picked up from the airport by Davy's driver, uh, and he drove them home the next day. 
Menendez performed the web search for one kilo of gold worth. So clearly that's when they got their gold bars, when they were picked up from the airport one day. And then um, the driver uh, exchanged, uh, a few months later, the driver exchanged two brief calls with Nadine Menendez, uh, who then texted Diabetes, writing, thank you, Christmas in January, which we referred to before. Mm -hmm. And the driver's fingerprints were later found on an envelope can, can contain $70,000 cash, which we, which we talked about. Okay. Uh, the... Uh, and then also there was a Menendez performed the Google search for a kilo of gold price as well after that. <laughs> um, okay, so um, Diabetes, the prosecutor who, was in the, who ended up being there was not theoretically chosen by Menendez. Yep. But his sentencing keeps getting postponed to this day. Ah, oh, okay. Which is an interesting little Yes, yeah, thing. yeah. I, I'm not, not necessarily drawing a connection there, but it's just something which I imagine is being investigated right, yes, at the yeah, very yeah. least. Then we have White Will Hanna who's a longtime friend of Nadine's, who had ties to Egyptian government officials. Yep. Shortly after she began dating Menendez, she helped Hannah arrange a series of meetings between Egyptian officials, which you referred to before, yep. and, and Menendez and Nadine. In exchange for those meetings, he allegedly said he'd give her a, quote, a low or no show job at his company. Mm. In 2019, the Egyptian government granted his company an exclusive monopoly on certifying that US food exports to Egypt were compliant with halal oh, standards. Oh, yes, yes. Even though he had zero experience in that <laughs> business area. There is a heavy suspicion that Menendez might have used his position as the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee oh. <laughs> to help him get that contract. Mm. When... Um, when Nadine found out about that, she texted uh, Menendez, seems like Halal went through. It might be a fantastic 2019 all the way round. <laughs> but then the US Department of Ag Agriculture thought it would raise costs for US meat supplies. So multiple officials contacted the Egyptian government to object to, to that appointment. Then Menendez, Menendez called a high-level department official and told them to back off. <laughs> and they did. Hannah soon then began paying Nadine uh, in this job, which she never showed up to, and also paid $23,000 of her mortgage so her house was no longer foreclosed upon. Mm. Very kind of him. Yes. Menendez also tried to lift the ban on US military aid for Egypt. You, talk, you talked about humanitarian aid. No, I was talking about military Well, apparently there's been a ban on military aid in Egypt. When was a ban put on? I don't know. Aid? I don't know. I was, I was interested when you were talking about this because, yeah. Was the, that a complete ban or was it a ban on some aspects of military aid? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But there was definitely a hold on, on – on, on, look it up. Look it up. Yeah, what, yeah. what I'm telling you is there was definitely a hold on military aid for Egypt at this point in time for human rights concerns. Yep. Now, Menendez uh, allegedly was started to represent Egypt – yeah. to try and get that ban lifted. And he went so far as to secretly ghostwrite a letter sent supposedly by Egypt to Menendez and other senators advocating for the hold to be lifted. Right. At the, uh, and uh, so he's, he's writing a letter to himself. Uh, and, uh, and billions of dollars of US military aid was soon directed to Egypt. Nadine sent a link to Hannah for an article reporting on $2.5 billion on military sales mm -hmm. to Egypt, writing... Bob had to sign off on this. Yes. Then one day afterwards, Nadine met Davies for lunch and then she went and bought and she then she went and brought two one kilo gold bars worth sixty thousand dollars each to a jeweler wow. for sale. It's always gold bars with his yes. Davies guy. Sorry, just an update yeah. on yes. that. So yes. the US um, gives about one point three billion dollars yep. in uh, military assistance to Egypt every year. Yeah. Um in 2021, under pressure from lawmakers in Congress, the Biden administration announced it was cancelling $130 million of that aid, so 10% of that aid okay. in right, concern, uh, in, due to human rights concerns. There we go. That's what Bob was uh, saying. No, we can't even withhold 10%. Bob could not abide that. Yes. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so we've got the gold bars. And then Hannah also connected Menendez to the third guy, who was Jose Uribe, who's another businessman working in trucking insurance who had also been previously convicted of fraud, another perfect friend for Menendez. Um, Uribe uh, had a friend who was being prosecuted by the New Jersey Attorney General's office mm -hmm. and one who's been investigated by that same office. Yeah. He was concerned that the cases could implicate him. So Menendez then called the New Jersey Attorney's office, something he's becoming well familiar with doing, <laughs> urging them to wrap up the prosecution immediately. <laughs> 
<laughs> Urubay gave Nadine fifteen thousand dollars that she used for a down payment on yeah, the Mercedes yeah. Benz convertible, and she texted him, "You are a miracle worker who makes dreams come true. I will always remember that." <laughs> and he continued to make monthly payments on the car afterwards. So they're, they're the facts. Them's the facts. <laughs> so, uh, would you? Uh, are you going to talk about Menendez's reaction to this, by the way, or are you going to go straight to the general politics? Um, I'm going to go to the politics. Okay. Then let's talk about Menendez's okay, reactions because right, okay. so that's one of the funniest elements is, of the story. Is. Okay, so. Yeah. Uh, you've just heard the facts. Yeah. So have all of Menendez's <laughs> Democratic colleagues in the Senate. Yeah. And now an unprecedented 26 of them have called on him to resign. 26? Yes. They like, given There are 51 of them and like, well, well, there are 50 of his colleagues and, and yeah. 24 hours ago it was three. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, the first of those was Fetterman. Yeah, there you go. Fetterman's like, you know, you, yeah. you say that I'm a disgrace to the Senate <laughs> in my hoodie. Well, look at this guy who always wears a suit. Dude, look what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Federman didn't say that. I'm no. putting words into his mouth. He was thinking it though. On his yeah, yeah, <laughs> on his behalf. So uh so far Chuck Schumer is not among them, mm-hmm. but Cory Booker, his fellow senator from New Jersey, <sighs> is hurts. is one of them, which has mm-hmm. got to hurt. Yeah. Um, according to one report I read, nearly every political figure of significance in the state of New Jersey has called upon him to yes. resign, yep. uh, including the governor. Yep. Um and so, yeah, the momentum is really building. The White House hasn't said anything. Chuck Schumer said he's entitled to a fair trial, but this is a lot of uh, this is a lot of pressure coming from Democrats. Now, you might be wondering what would happen if um, if Menendez stepped down. What would happen is that the governor of New Jersey would appoint his yes. replacement to the Senate, who would undoubtedly. Be a, be, be a Democrat. So it's a free hit for them. It is a free hit yeah, for them. Yeah. So Menendez is up for election next year. Mm. Um, so he'd be, he'd be going for his fourth term. Mm. There is considerable worry among Democrats that even though uh, Republicans haven't had a senator from New Jersey since 1972, that next year could be tricky. And if we have a look at the uh, the 2021 gubernatorial election, remember Republicans came a lot closer to winning that office mm. than uh, than was expected. So New Jersey can't be taken for granted. It's a little bit like New York in terms of it's a blue state, but there's a hell of a lot of red in it and uh, a hell of a lot of motivated red in it. And they worry that if Menendez is on the ballot, then there are uh, there are house seats in New Jersey that they could probably say goodbye to. He, he is he is already being primary though. Like within, yeah, yeah. within, oh, yeah. within hours of when, primary. Yeah, yes. within, within hours of the allegations yeah, coming yeah. out. The, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, there, there, there was primary. already someone who was yeah. primarying him, but mm. uh, that person has most likely been forgotten because uh, yeah, there's now a lot of credible uh, yeah credible primary contenders. So yeah, but. I don't see him voluntarily stepping there. Oh, no, he's definitely not. No, no, yeah, that's a nice segue there. Uh, so yeah. not, not from his reaction. To his, no. <laughs> okay, his first reaction. He's had a few reactions. Hmm. First reaction was, uh, for years, forces behind the scenes have repeatedly attempted to silence my voice and dig <gasps> my political grave. The excesses of these prosecutors is apparent. They have misrepresented the normal work of a congressional office. Misrepresented. Those beso- behind this campaign simply cannot accept the first generation Latino American from humble beginnings could rise to be a US senator and serve with honor and distinction. Racists. Racists. They're all racists. Yeah. It's clear. And, and he followed up with uh, it's not lost on me how quickly some are rushing to judge a Latino and push him out of his seat. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> He's doing it for Latinos everywhere, Dave. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, the, uh, we talked about his cash reaction. Yes. Uh, but, uh, so, do you think that's going to be effective? Uh, the the racist call. Do you think that's uh, no, no, no? I don't think. I don't think so. No, absolutely not. I don't know what he's doing. No, I honestly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's um, uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's an interesting. It's, one. A, it's an interesting, interesting, interesting tack for him to take. Do you think with the with the when you're talking about the Republicans, yeah. and, and the potential the potential uh, New Jersey up for grabs, yeah. Like I know he had. Like negative fifty eight percent approval rating when he when he finished his governorship. But yeah. do you think do you think that that that's Chris Christie? Chris Christie. You think, you think that's Chris Christie? Opening potential? for Chris Christie. Uh, I don't. I don't actually really know that there are any openings big enough for Chris Christie <laughs> anymore. Oh, that that was not a cheap crack. But, uh, but like, 
No, I don't, he doesn't want to be a senator anyway. Well, that's what he says. He doesn't want to be a yeah, senator. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, uh, but anyway. Um, I did actually. The other, yeah, go on. So the, the other mm-hmm. political element of this, yes. of course, is that this is Merrick Garland's Justice Department who is bringing these charges yes. against yeah. uh, Bob Menendez. Yeah. And so for a lot of Democrats, this is like, look, here's a you know Democratic administration with a Justice Department that is actually – targeting a Democratic senator in a way that could endanger the Democrats' Senate majority. Yes. Like that actually has really serious uh, political ramifications. So Mm. they're saying this is evidence of the independence of the Justice Department that it is, uh, you know, that it is going after a a Democrat like this. Now, of course, this is not going to appease Republicans. No, no, well, no. If anything, they would probably see this as part of the conspiracy to try to detract from what they see as the Justice Department's inaction and covering up around, uh, you know, Hunter Biden that, and Joe Biden. That's exactly the argument they're using. Yes, they're, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're using the, the Menendez, Menendez yeah, yeah, is the yeah. softest possible target to try and make themselves oh, seem Bob Who cares about him yeah, when yeah. you know they've, the <laughs> Democrats have a Senate majority of one? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who yeah. possibly cares about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so okay, this is not going to make anybody uh, anybody happy. But. Trump has been arguing though that that everyone's going that that Democrats are too soft on Menendez and Menendez. What, what wrote, do they want? Well, let me read you his truth. Yeah, and let me just just <laughs> let, let me just flag that with just a general theory. I, I, I might be I might have a little mini tangent treehouse at the end of this. Okay, that I I genuinely think that yeah. one of the less reported stories at the moment. Mm is that Trump is genuinely becoming senile. Like as, as much as we're talking about Biden's age and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. we should because yeah, he yeah. really is. Yeah. Like when you watch his speeches, Biden's speeches, his, his whole speech in context, Yes. what's clear is that Biden hasn't lost his mind at all. No. When people say he has, he hasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that he is about to die. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he no, is I've, incredibly I've always, old. I've always said it's yes. it's not the mental problem; it's yeah. the physical problem. Like, we can okay. That's that's buying too much into Cartesian dualism, but that's yeah. a debate for another time. Yeah. 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 Well, he's slurring his words. I mean, but anyway. Yes. But my point is that. But I am genuinely concerned about Donald Trump's brain. Okay. And let me read you this truth. Yep. As one of the most <laughs> senile <laughs> things he has he has truth yes. out. Yeah. 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 And and just imagine if you would if yeah. Joe Biden. Yeah. said this. Okay. Okay? Yes. Let us read this out. Yeah. Senate Democrats should all resign based on Senator Bob Menendez. <laughs> they all knew what was going on and the way he lived. Why doesn't the FBI raid Senate Democrats' homes like they illegally raided Mar-a-Lago where nothing was done wrong based on the Presidential Records Act? Menendez is a piker compared to some of those election-stealing thugs. Can you imagine how much crooked Joe Biden has stolen and what's in some of his many homes he has two homes by the way <laughs> the fbi this is trump saying that yeah, yeah the yeah. fbi and justice notified him that they were gonna that they would be going in to look in a few weeks in other words get rid of the cash gold and documents asap before we get there here's gold now joe yeah, biden yeah. they didn't give me any warning they just showed up hunter lived with crooked joe in delaware it would be a treasure hunt crooked's coffers must be loaded up with cash i wonder how much they got paid for rigging the election Menendez is one of many, a small timer at that. Every Democrat should resign from the Senate, in caps. Our borders are broken. Our elections are rigged. MAGA. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily know that's evidence of senility. That, he, his brain's gone. Well. But none of that makes sense. It's just a, it's just a trail of, of no, not saying consciousness, it's subconsciousness. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just... Look, but this is the, this like a is, dreamscape. This is what a lot of people sound like in their unedited form. Do they? Look, and they're it, all senile then. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, sorry. Yes. Look, uh, you know, I one of my um, pet peeves about the way that everything is going at the moment mm. is the general lack of editing in every sense. Yeah. Right. It, the the role of editors and sub editors is being degraded in media organisations. Um, social media, at least, at least Twitter, kind of used to have an inbuilt editorial function, at mm. least in the sense that when you only had 140 characters to play with, you had to be concise. Mm. Uh, things really started to go to shit when they changed it to 280 mm. uh, to, to 280 characters. But you, uh, 140 characters 
enforces a discipline on yes, people. It does, yeah. But the House style, especially on the Trumpian right now, mm. is completely unedited. Yeah. Uh, just go, basically go at length until you run out of breath. Mm. This is how everybody is talking on that side. Chuck as many adjectives and adverbs that you can into every single sentence. Yeah, just string things along together until you have created your perfect mega mega sentence and then push the send button out of sheer exhaustion, mm. right? It, it's. I don't think this is senility. I think this is basically the house style that Trump has created at this point and you see more and more people uh, going into this. It's just... More is always better. But I'm not talking I'm talking about the length. I'm talking about he's calling for every Democrat to resign because of Menendez. Yeah, well, I'm sure there are a lot of people. That doesn't make any sense go, at all. No, no, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> well, I'm sure he's not the only person who's said that. I reckon he is. I reckon he is. I reckon he's the only person that that, (laughs) said every Senate Democrat should resign. Every Senate Democrat should resign because Bob Menendez is corrupt. It's this sort of, and this is the other side of it. It's, um, it's not just this sort of maximalist language. It's maximalist fantasy, Mm. right? Absolute victory. Uh, Mm. (laughs) Every measure has to be one hundred percent. You know, kill them all. Um, It's yeah. I I don't think this is senility. I actually think that this is where Trumpian logic is is going. Yeah. yeah, there's a logic to it, which is not what you'd call your classic Aristotelian logic, but there is a logic there that is driving okay. all of this. Uh, look, well, I, I would argue though, if Joe Biden, yeah, tweeted that out, yeah, there would be like. Like I, I can't even imagine how yeah. how much people would be going on about that. Like that, yes. like that would just be saying, "Oh my god, the, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. just let's just book the yes. Undertaker right now." Yes. By the <laughs> way, <laughs> I'm fully aware of the irony <laughs> and hypocrisy of me complaining about a lack of editing on a podcast that routinely goes for more than two hours. <laughs> we, but, get, we fit a lot in there. Yeah, yeah. And also, <laughs> by the way, though, Chaz does a lot of editing. I do. I yeah, do. <laughs> yeah. Not not usually in the sense of making it shorter, but no, he. No, uh, no, yeah, yeah. No. So, so so look, I'm I'm fully aware mm. of uh, of our hypocrisy because we are also of the <laughs> just go at length until you run out of breath school. But uh, yeah, it, it's different though when it's a very powerful person doing it. Sure. As a little side, by the way, on the Trump saying every Democrat should resign because yes. they all knew what was going on in the way he lived. There are two asides that are, this is where my punchline's coming. Okay. There are, there are, there are two asides. Oh, that, okay, you've that, been winding <laughs> yes. this one up for about half an hour See, now. I, I do plan things. Okay. There are two asides yeah. which are, I think are quite funny. First yes. of all, and not many people know about this one, Yeah, this is Trump talking to a comedian who he thinks is Bob Menendez. The comedian is pretending to be Bob Menendez. He rang up Trump posing as Bob Menendez wow. directly after Bob Menendez beat his first corruption charge. Okay. This is the phone call. <laughs> okay. Hi, Bob. Hey, how are you? How are you? Well, congratulations on everything. We're proud of you. Congratulations, great job. You went through a tough, tough situation, and I don't think a very fair situation, but congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, so so much for so much for how all the Democrats should resign because they all knew what was going on in the way he lived. <laughs> Trump, Trump, when thinking he was speaking to Bob Menendez directly after he directly after he got off his corruption charge, said how it was unfair. Yeah, and how good. Uh, congratulations, wow. well done. So that's number one. Number two. Uh, you know what Trump did two uh, two years after Bob Menendez got off that corruption no, charge? No, what did he do? Just before he left the presidency? Yep. He commuted the Medicare fraud sentence of Menendez's briber. Wow. Salaman Melgan. Oh! <laughs> and, and remember, he got done for, for a different Medicare fraud. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> later on. And he was supposed to go to jail for a very long period of time. Yes. And Trump, uh, there you Trump, go. Trump said- the, Come full circle. The ends of justice do not require- Melgren to remain confined until his currently projected release date of August 2, 2031. <laughs> so, so much for being outraged by yes. corruption. Yes. There you go. Congratulations. That's the punchline. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've landed the landing. Yep. Um, You've pointed out Trump being inconsistent about. I know. Something. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take my uh, I'll take my Pulitzer now. Thank you. Um, 
Dave, let's. Oh, while we're talking about Trump, yeah, because I, I have maneuvered it around the Trump. Yes, we might as yeah, well keep yeah, yeah. on going. You had an update on Trump legals. Oh know. yes, so this was a very interesting development this morning, and not one that certainly not one that I was expecting. So this is the civil trial in New York. This is the least talked about trial, which was due to begin mm. on Monday, mm. and both. Tr- so this is about Trump or the Trump organization inflating the value of its real estate. Mm. There's inflating the value of its real estate for investors and then deflating it massively when it came to tax assessments. And they're accused not just of inflating the price but even of inflating the square footage. So Mm. uh, one of the things that has come out is the triplex that Trump was actually living in in Trump Tower, which is about 11,000 square feet, he claimed was 30,000. Square feet. 30,000. That's quite a lot more. Yes. So Letitia <laughs> James is claiming that uh, his property inflations amounted to $2.2 billion worth of fraud and she's seeking $250 million in fines. Now, both Letitia James and Trump's lawyers asked for pretrial summaries. Right. So, in other words, they actually wanted the judge to make some judgments before the trial that would then narrow the scope of the trial. Mm -hmm. So, what Trump's lawyers were asking were for the charges to be dismissed, which they seemed reasonably confident about because another court found back in June that a lot of the things that Letitia James were bringing forward were very old. Yeah, outside statute limitations. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's certainly true. These claims have been around for a long time. Mm. Like in David K. Johnson's book, The Making of Donald Trump, he's talking about this practice going back a very uh, very long time. So it was quite a shock when Justice Engeron said that ruling is pretty much irrelevant to this case and instead found in favour of Letitia James or basically found what you know what Letitia James was asking for in the pretrial motions and found that he had been engaging in the systematic inflation of property prices so the judge has basically already found against Trump in this case which means that the trial due to begin next week will instead be about the scope of punishment uh, rather than oh. about whether he did anything wrong in the first place. Now, of course, this is going to be appealed. So this is like the E.J. Carroll one all over again. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 so this is definitely going to be appealed. Uh, Trump's lawyers are saying he's just totally disregarding the precedent here that was set by that other court mm. uh, back in June. I think that seems to be the major thing that they're going to be fighting on. Um, you know, they're also claiming that, oh, you know, when you do real estate appraisals, it's... It's common to make uh, trivial mistakes. The judge was like, when you're looking at inflating the square footage of an apartment from 11,000 mm. feet to 30,000 feet, that is not some kind of innocent mistake. That's mm. uh, that's fraud. So it looks like what it'll be coming back to is uh, are these charges or are these accusations um, actually too old? But, yeah, that was, uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Mm. Um, Trump has predictably pointed out that Engeron is a Democrat and described him as deranged. Uh, Trump's <laughs> He's lawyers, deranged. Yeah, yeah Trump's yeah. lawyers have said that, so because one of the possible punishments here is the Trump, the Trump organisation will basically lose control of a whole lot of New York real estate, possibly including Trump Tower itself. Mm. The Trump organisation would have to be unwound, although, I mean, the Trump organisation is kind of a symbolic label that covers about 500 different entities, but still it will be an important symbolic thing. But as we were discussing earlier, this could actually be one of the more materially significant uh, things that emerges from government investigations in terms of this could actually stop the Trump organisation from doing a lot of business in New York. So Trump's lawyers are saying... This is the nationalisation of one of America's most successful corporate entities. Now, it is not one of America's most successful (laughs) corporate entities. It's actually fairly piddling even by the standards of New York real estate. Mm. Uh, But it could be pretty damaging to the Trump organisation, definitely. In fact, and certainly for people who want to see Trump go down, the thing that might be a sobering thought is if this is held up, if it survives appeal, this could actually be the, the... only significant punishment that comes out of any of the government uh, investigations because the rest are going to rely on juries, which Mm. Chaz has talked Mm. at length about Mm. the potential uh, problems with uh, with juries. Mm. This one looks quite likely to stick. Um, Mm. If if it does survive the appeal, and 
well, I don't know uh, what the chances of that are. But if it does survive the, the appeal, he is in, you know, his business is yeah. actually in big trouble. It's hard to see how anyone in couldn't, New York. couldn't rule against this, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I could rule yeah, against Yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is blatant. It's yeah, so blunt. This is very blatant. Yeah. So, yeah, the only yeah. question is, does that previous court's ruling about these yeah. accusations being too old actually matter yeah. uh, for this, yeah, oh, for this case? Go. So, yeah. Um, that is potentially a bit of trouble for, like, real trouble for Trump in terms of that actually does affect his businesses. On the other hand, though, you could definitely make the argument Trump's central business now is raising, uh, you know, is is raising money from his supporters. Yeah. Like, his old core businesses don't really matter much anymore. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this is just going to uh, prompt more people to open their hearts and open their wallets to good old Mr. Trump. Yeah. That is true. That's yeah. true. Well, what, 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 let's just keep on rolling on the Trump train. Okay. What, what time, time is it? Policy time. time. What time is it? Policy time. time. What time is it? Policy time. Right. I love that thing. Let's finish off what we started last week. Let's finish what we started. Let's finish. We'll start finish with immigration. Uh, obviously, this is his number one area, and he's got a lot of policies in this area, and he yeah. actually just revisited them all. Just confirmed all the things I was about to say uh, this week. Okay. Uh, first of all, obviously, complain the wall. Uh, bear in mind, he built about 50, 50 new miles of wall, if that, yes. in, his, in his first term. Yep. Uh, although, to be fair, like people do mention that. Mm. To be fair, he did strengthen like 300 miles of wall. So, yeah, that's something. But still, given he was Mr. Wall, yeah. he really should have built more than 50 miles, um, especially after he blatantly broke the constitution to um mm. to get the funding for that yes. didn't even use it um anyway uh look they're, they're, they're fair enough about building the wall you know, people you know, if they want to build the wall they can build the wall whatever you know it's it's um people can obviously climb the wall but you know whatever i i, I personally i must say leaving aside the things like it's a hazard for animals and for local property owners. Yes, I've never actually had a theoretical problem with a wall. To be honest, I like 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 the idea of having a border that's hard to cross. I don't think that's an insane idea. I just think that it's not going to achieve achieve what they think. No, it's it was always achieve. a far more yeah. symbolic. Yeah. Than, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, than but material. Just, whatever. I mean, it, it would gesture. Get, I mean, yeah, there are part, obviously there are parts of the U.S. border where there is a physical wall yeah. and has been one for a very long time. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I. Uh, yeah, and I know I know there's a lot of non-wall security out there, obviously as well. Um, there have been though, even with that, all that non-wall security, one and a half million gotaways under Biden. That's one and a half million people who they know have crossed the border, who they have no idea who they were and mm. how it happened. Uh, they just had a signal, someone just crossed the border, and they couldn't get to them. Mm. One and a half million times. Um, anyway, so that's the first thing that's obvious. All right, okay. He wants to expand Texas's floating boy system. You know the the the, the, you know, the floating boys. No, the uh, Greg ba- Abbott has put in the. Uh, I assume in the this river. is B U O Y. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> we should. Yes. We, we should, okay. Yes. Should specify that. Yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. B U O Y. He's put these floating boys with like um, kind of sort of like I don't know. I wouldn't say it's barbed wire, but it's like wire wire mm. fencing and stuff around them to basically make it impossible to cross in that part of the river. Yep. Uh, and there's some concern about that, about that, that, um, that those boys make people cross in more dangerous parts of the mm. river, which, and then they end up getting killed or yes, drowning. Yeah. The, uh, like when you cover the safest area like that, yes. it just encourages yeah, yeah, people yeah. to go dangerous areas. Um, he wants to expand. I mean, the, the Supreme Court's in the process of potentially invalidating those boys. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but Trump wants to expand them. He likes them. Uh, we'll find out if they're against the law in the next few months. He wants to reinstate the remaining Mexico policy, which uh, neither Mexico nor the courts liked very much. No. So I don't think he's going to get that up. No. But whatever. If you recall, in theory, I didn't mind that in theory when they when they first mm. proposed it. Like in that, that was essentially the same as the Malaysia solution that Australia posited at one point in time, which is the idea being that when when a when an illegal, when you intercept an illegal immigrant, you process them in a place that isn't your country, and then if if they if they don't uh, satisfy the conditions for asylum, 
they, they, they don't get into the country. Whereas if they're in the country, then they appeal and appeal and appeal and they mm. can be there for years. And so it becomes a lot longer. Um, I understand the logic of that. But for that to work, what you need to do is you need to actually process those people. Yes. And Trump did not do that. No. Trump basically just shoved them in a shanty town in Mexico yeah, yeah. and ignored them. Yeah. And those, those places became just crime magnets essentially mm. uh, those people had horrible lives they were there for for like six months yeah, yeah. with no hope of actually being processed it was just it was just a obvious dereliction of your duty to process asylum seekers yes yeah essentially um, by the way Australian offshore processing is pretty bad as well oh I'm not saying it's great yes. but I'm just I'm just, yeah. I'm just saying for like like the for those that, who are wondering yeah, 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 yeah Australia's yeah. not some great success story of the Definitely. wonders of offshore processing well Australia's not, not not a great success story in any respect when it comes to no. Im- illegal immigrants no but the um, but we we uh, we are often used as the model for other countries yes. and this is an example like they they got the Romanian Mexico idea from Australia yes right? they explicitly got it from Australia yes um, but uh, anyway, the uh, like I said, I, I could conceivably see a world where if you process them very rapidly, if you had lots of like judges, immigration judges right there, mm-hmm. and you process them bang, 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 I see the logic. If you can do, you can, it's possible to do that in a humane fashion. Yes, that that accords with your duties as a as a, a, according to the Refugee Convention, right? Yes, like in the and the Asylum Seeker Convention. Um, but that's not what they did. No. And the way they did it was blatantly illegal. And as I said, Mexico will not let them do it again. Yeah. Mexico basically stopped Biden from doing that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the next thing. He wants to negotiate deals with Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador to send people to each of them instead of allowing them to seek asylum in the United States. As in, if you come from Honduras and, we, and, and America processes them and goes, yes, you, you've qualified for asylum – you can seek asylum in El Salvador and then they ship them off to El Salvador. That makes no sense. Of course it doesn't because each of these countries are separately so shit that you're saying, yes, someone qualifies for asylum from that country. Yes, yeah. So why don't you uh, gain that asylum in another country that's so bad that people require asylum? Yes. Once again, I can understand a world. Once again, this idea comes from Australia. I could, that, it comes from yes, the, it, yeah, it's yeah. the, it's the regional solution yes, idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could understand a world where America and Canada and Germany and a bunch of first world countries got together and said, we don't want people to, to essentially location shop mm. with asylum. So when they come to us, we will process them. And when, if they, if they qualify for asylum, they will go into a hat and they'll end up going to Mm. a country that qualifies as a place where you can get asylum. Yeah. Like Germany or mm. like Canada or like Australia yeah, yeah. or whatever, a first world country. Mm. But that's if that's the way you do it in a humane way. Yeah. The way he was suggesting you do it is a bullshit way. Yes. Where you then send them to some other scummy country. Yeah. Right, so um yeah anyway, so but that's that's what he wants to do. Um that would be legally suspect. Because yes. once again, that America has a duty under the law, under the conventions it's signed and the law as it stands to when people are actually el- eligible for asylum to give them asylum. Yes. And shipping them off to Honduras is not giving them no. asylum. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he wants to bring back Title 42, which if you recall was during the COVID period, that was yes. that was anyone who could potentially spread some kind of uh, uh, some kind of deadly disease, mm-hmm. they don't let in. Yeah. No matter what the circumstances are. Once again, fair enough. Yes. If there's actually fear of a deadly disease, yeah. It, I, I argued at the time that COVID barely qualified. Mm. Uh, I thought certainly didn't qualify two years later, Joe yes. Biden. No. But, uh, the, um, but anyway, now there's definitely no deadly disease. Yes. And so that's complete bullshit. That would clearly be illegal. Absolutely. And I'm absolutely sure the Supreme Court won't let him do it. Yeah. But the, uh, um, but he'll try. Yes. That's the next policy. Uh, John Eastman's back. He wants to get rid of birthright citizenship for children born in the US. Uh, so what, for those who don't know what that means, it's in the Constitution. If you're born in America, you are an American citizen. Yes. Even if your parents are illegal immigrants, even if you're, even if someone flies in on a plane, there's on a tourist visa, yep. and they give, birth, they give birth in the two weeks they're in America, their kid is an American citizen. Yes. Right? Now, uh, John Eastman feels like the Constitution's been misinterpreted, and uh, and even though it's pretty ex- it's pretty explicit about that, yeah. And Trump wants to wants to uh, pass a law to get rid of it. Mm. 
he says that it provides incentives for anchor babies, for people that come to America so they can have kids, so then they have to stay in America to look after their kids because they're now American citizens. That's his, that's his logic. Yes. Um, the problem with this is, I mean, there's a lot of problems with this, yeah. but the main problem from a logical point of view yes. is that if, you, if someone is born in America and you say they're not an American citizen, mm. then who do they belong to? Yes. They're a stateless individual. Yeah. You send them to you send them to Guatemala. They don't belong in Guatemala either. No, they have no country. Yes, yeah. That's the reason this exists. Yes. So it's it's kind of yeah it, it's it's not a very sensible policy. I mean, from a cruelty yeah. point of view, it's probably a great policy. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from a yeah from a like just a, a rational way the world can work point of view. And and I'll tell you what happens when you do that. What you do what, what happens when you do that is if they're not citizens, they go underground. You're not going to get them anyway. Mm. And they become part of the cash economy, yeah. Which is going to help crime, yeah. Like that's that's what happens. You yes. are, there will be more crime if you do that. That's a guarantee, yeah. Because these people will have no legal way to live. That's right. Um, okay, so that's that that, that 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 those are some of his solutions. Yeah. Uh, it's um, and I think I've been quite charitable on some of them. You're being very way. charitable. Yeah, yes. but but just some of them. Yeah, yeah. Even being charitable just make no sense. No. Then we get to the deportations. Uh, He says, we're going to carry out the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. And I believe him. Uh, He wants to get the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, and the National Guard involved in deporting people. Um, Which, you know, they uh, are... Now, there's... Look, in theory, I could understand you having... Once again, I'm trying to be charitable here. I can understand Mm. you having defined tasks for the FBI and for the DEA and the ATF. But they've got to be... Really defined tasks, mm. right? The because uh, you don't you don't just want this authoritarian state where there's just police roaming around trying. Well, to- that's exactly what some people want. Well, that, I mean, if they, they if they actually do elect Trump, that mm. is what people are voting for. Quite possibly, and they, they know that that's what they're going to be voting. Quite for. possibly, and, and you'll get a similar situation to what I just described before, yeah. which is all forms of law enforcement. Yes, are going to be figures of fear. Yes, for illegal immigrants, yes. of whom there are tens of millions. Yes. And they're just going to be on the run constantly. Yeah. You're not going to catch them. No. And they're just going to, where they're going to turn, they're going to turn to crime. Yes. There'll be more crime. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, it, it, um, he also wants to send the Navy and the Coast Guard to form a blockade in Latin American waters to deter drug smuggling boats. Seems unlikely to work, given they're very little boats, these boats. Yes. And the boat, the, the Navy Coast Guard boats are a bit bigger. Um, and it's a very big area to try and blockade, but whatever. He wants to use the Alien Sedition Acts of 1798 to declare unauthorized crossings as an invasion and to declare members of gangs or cartels, smugglers and criminals as alien enemies so they can be automatically deported without any process. That's just not going to fly. No. Like enemies has a has a definition yes. in the law yeah, and yeah. that is people you're at war with. Yes. So that's not going to fly. Um, an invasion has a definition as well, and yeah. that's not going to fly either. So yes. forget that. That's just bullshit. That's dreamland stuff. Then we get to the really extreme stuff. I haven't been mentioning extreme stuff yet. He wants to designate drug cartels as unlawful enemy combatants to give the US military the green light to target them in Mexico with military forces. He wants to he wants to uh, also uh, uh, yeah, deport them without any process whatsoever. Um, I should say... That the Sands and Ramaswamy share that policy. Of course they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's fairly poorly thought out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, you can imagine. Yeah. What is going to yeah. make me sound masculine? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, do, 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 do you want to talk to this? It sounds like you've got a no, 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 no. Right. no. Well, I would just argue to you, Yeah. how do you reckon Mexico will react to America launching military incursions into their country? Yeah, see, that actually <laughs> could potentially count as an invasion. Yes, <laughs> that, absolutely could. actual invasion. Yeah. Sending the armed forces over the border with yeah. weapons to kill people, that that's closer to the definition of an invasion than someone- An uh, illegal you know, immigrant. Yeah, crossing <laughs> the border to try and find a job. Yes, so, yes, yeah. yes. Um, and and leaving aside the the potential war with Mexico, I mean, yeah, yes. America, I'm sure, doesn't fear a war with Mexico. No, but they are. Mexico is America's number one trading partner. Yeah, so it would sink the economy. Yes, like if you did that, like mm. if, if if like if 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 Mexico started to to mm. fight in any way, shape, or form with America. Yeah, uh, and if America really began to threaten Mexico, it would take about two seconds for Mexico to get in bed with China. Yes, and America would not like that. No. 
at all if China started to support Mexico yeah. right on their fucking border. Yes. So that, and I think of all the people who would dislike that, I think Trump would be number one. Yes. So I don't think he's thought this one through. Um, the uh, also, how do you reckon the cartels would react if they, this started happening? Because I tell you what they would do. There are 1.6 million Americans hanging around in Mexico. Yes. That's 1.6 million targets for the cartels yep. and hostages and all the rest of it. Mm. Like this is not a war that Trump will win. Yeah. If he starts this war. Yeah. So I uh, uh the uh, so I would I mean yeah. not like um, I think on some level he's aware that this would never happen. Mm. Like that this is pure fantasy. Yeah. That even his his conservative allies are not going to let this happen. See, when I mean, you say that, you say that and you may be right, but okay, maybe for Trump. Yep. But remember, this is also a policy of DeSantis. And, oh, I forget Ramos. Yeah, well, no, but the I, thing is- I tell you what, DeSantis, yeah. he doesn't talk like Trump. No. Like, if he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. There, uh, no, I, I, I actually think it would get stopped legally. Yeah, you're I think lawyers right. would yeah. stop it. Yeah, you're when right. I, you're and, you know, right. Lawyers are very important conservative yeah. allies. Yeah. Um, not all of them, obviously, but like- mm. uh, the, the conservative movement needs its lawyers. Mm. The lawyers would say no mm. to using the Alien and Sedition Act to uh, try to justify an American invasion of Mexico. Mm. Yeah. You, you're, They'd just say no. You are probably right. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I, I should also just point out as well that if you're worried about, if it did happen, and I know I, yeah. your point is probably right, if you worry about the violence of illegal immigrants, which they say they are, mm. and by the way, illegal immigrants – commit less crimes yes. than, than, than citizens do. Yeah. But if you're worried about the violence of illegal immigrants, just wait for the violence from a full-on war with a cartel. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's, it's going to be pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay, so that, that's, that, that, that's, that's that. Then we've got legal immigration as well. Mm. Um, he wants to reduce legal immigration as well, which doesn't make much sense because the number one way to decrease illegal immigration is to increase legal immigration because mm. most of these people are not trying to to live on the streets for for yes. years and years and years. Yeah, they yeah. prefer just to come in legally and yeah, yeah. have a good life. Mm, that's right. <laughs> and, um, so if you reduce legal immigration, you're probably going to place extra pressure on illegal immigration. But anyway, he yes. wants to reduce legal immigration via more screening. He wants country of origin screening. He wants to bring the Muslim ban back. He wants to. He wants ideological screening, which is ideological an screening. One. Congress passed some laws which you may not be aware of after World War One. Uh, staying with the immigration law of 1918, which does, which um, was they were designed to protect the United States against un-American and subversive activities that were considered threats to national security. Um, and basically, they allowed you to detain, deport, register, identify, and track members of the Communist Party. Yes. Yeah. And anarchists as well. Yeah. Tr yeah. Trump wants to use those laws to screen and deport wow. what he calls Marxists. Wow. And remember, anyone's a Marxist. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, but Marxists obviously are not communists, especially not the way Trump's, <laughs> Trump uses Marxists. Uh, the Supreme Court might have something to say about they that. They probably would. Yeah. Yes. But if they didn't, whoa. Yeah. Then, then you got some problems. Yeah, yeah. Because like, literally anyone who's who, – even to the right of Trump, he'll call them a Marxist. Yeah, Anyone yeah. disagrees with Trump is a Marxist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the uh, – okay. But the, the – and, and, and uh, I, I mean, obviously, you don't need me to point this out, but the yeah. fact he wants to decrease legal immigration as well mm. – Really gives the game away that this is this, yeah yeah that this is just nativism like, yeah yeah just, like, I just, mean we have to remember about his last administration as much as you had all of the fireworks around illegal immigration the big changes actually happened on the legal side of the ledger yeah and and, and refugees as well yeah yeah legal immigration was basically halved mm. um, and mm. that was done by. Cu massively cutting down the number of visas mm. that were available. In, in fact, eliminating entire visa categories. And this was all the, you know, the brainchild of Steve Miller. Yeah. Basically. But it was it was incredibly effective in achieving its aims. Yeah. Yeah. The I, I gotta say, once again, trying to be fair here, mm. I have sympathy for the argument that gets used by people like Steve Miller, where they go, all these, all these family re reunifications, like yeah, you, yeah. you get chain immigration, you're like one person comes in and then their brother comes in and then their nephew comes in and then they just yeah. like I, I have a sympathy for that. But just there are ways if you don't want to if you don't want to do that, there are ways to avoid that. I mean once I've again, got a lot more sympathy with Steve Miller's family members who told him he was being <laughs> a dickhead 
because their Jewish family had had to come in by a process that people would now refer to as chain immigration. Yeah, yeah a long time ago. Look, I, I have more sympathy for his relatives as well. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but, but I was just going to say that that yeah. like Australia is actually an example in this case, and so yeah, is yeah. Canada. Yeah, where they have way, way, way higher immigration levels than America does. Mm, yes, yeah, but they have a merit system. Mm. Like where where you you, you score a certain amount of points for this yes, that yeah. and the other, and then you get through. And they, I mean, there's there's some family reunification as well. Yeah, but America has almost no merit system at all. I mean, there there is actually a a bar that you need to clear for a lot of these. Yes, but just I mean, if they want to make it more inverted commas economically mm. effective, there's yeah. ways of doing that without being nativist. Yes, but yeah. they they're just obsessed with reducing immigration. Yes, for whatever reason. Anyway, that, that 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 this is basically all the immigration policies I've seen from Trump. So, do you have any any thoughts or any comments? Have I have I covered enough? No, you've you have covered more than enough. <laughs> okay, all right. I've now dealt with Trump policy. Okay. Uh, it's, it's the, the Michigan, Michigan corner. corner. I'm stretching Michigan corner a little bit here. No, but, not really. But, you know, the, the strike does involve Michigan. Yeah, yeah, lot. yeah. So let's talk, talk about the strike. United Auto Workers. Yes. And just to give a bit of historical background, the UAW historically was one of America's most powerful unions because it's actually a union from the heyday of cooperation between mm. workers and companies yes. in America. So mm. when the United States was the manufacturing powerhouse of the world, when there was basically continuing growth of the manu- manufacturing sector, when everyone was getting rich, people like Henry Ford were actually keen to strike good deals with unions, partly because they wanted to be their workers to be their consumers of their products as well. So Henry Ford wanted his workers to be able to buy Fords. Mm. In the Detroit Art Institute, there was actually a mural commissioned by Henry Ford, uh, painted by Diego Rivera, who wouldn't be allowed into the United States (laughs) under Trump's planned uh, immigration Mm. policy, definite Marxist. But it's this mural depicting in the 30s all of this cooperation between Uh, workers and capitalists. And the real peak of UAW influence was in the 1950s when the UAW would periodically negotiate with with the big three uh, Detroit automakers all at once. So that back then was Ford, GM and Chrysler. Chrysler is now known as Stellantis. And they, you know, they got very good deals. I remember reading in the Detroit Free Press, Michigan has the second highest number of golf courses per capita in America, which is a legacy of the UAW, the peak of the UAW's power when the whole ideology was that, you know, workers should, in, they should enjoy the good life. And uh, auto workers were among the highest paid, um, you know, certainly highest paid workers in America for people who didn't have a college degree, which at that point was nearly everyone in America. So um, the UAW, very historically powerful union, like every historical power, powerful union has lost a huge amount of power mm. and uh, and influence since that heyday, which is one of the things that makes the industrial action that we're seeing now so significant. So once again, they're actually negotiating with the big three all at once, which is something that they haven't attempted for a long time. They're also enacting um, strikes on a scale that hasn't been done for a long time. Now, their tactic is not that everyone goes on strike at once and shuts down the whole industry. It's that at any given time, I think about 10% of the UAW membership is uh, is striking. I think currently it's about 12,000 people, or a bit less than 10%, 12,000 people out of 149,000. So there are numerous plants all over the Midwest that are having Strike action. At this point in time, I'll give you the exact numbers. Yep. There's 146,000 UA, UAW workers who work for the big three car companies. Yep. There are, the first round had 13,000 workers from right. three sites. Okay. And the second round, they've added um, uh, 38 new sites uh, right. with, where there are parts distribution centers, but they have less employees. Yep. About 5,600 more workers. So total, yes. 18,000 out of 146,000. Right. Okay, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so part of this tactic is they can put a lot of pressure on but they've got scope to expand, huge, huge scope to uh, expand. Now, a strike is very consequential for a lot of reasons. A strike in this industry has immediately visible effects throughout the entire American um, supply chain. Uh, Already 
the media is talking about the damage that this could do to the economy, damage that this could do to economic recovery. It's also politically significant because it involves states that have been among the most electorally significant in recent years, including Michigan, also Wisconsin. Um, So um, before we get to the specific uh, politics of what's going on there, though, at the moment, I just want to take a bit of a bigger picture Mm. on this, which is, at the moment, we are going through a period of increased industrial militancy in yes. the United States, an unusually high period of strikes. So I mentioned the Los Angeles hotel strike that was going on while I was there, the 40 hotels involved in that. Um, my hotel was not, that's why I chose it, but I would walk past these other hotels on the way to the convention centre and the pickets were very vigorous, uh, basically at all hours of the day and night. Like I walked past at 10.30, they're still there playing instruments because they want to, you know, they they want to be disruptive. Um, they were shutting down, uh, you know, they were shutting down intersections in, in Los Angeles. And at the same time, the, well, the writer's strike has just come to an end uh, in Hollywood, the mm. actor's strike is still going on. I won't get into and, all... And that was massive. That was that was absolutely like, huge. Okay, like, I'll put the graph up right yeah. now yes. of showing the number of um, days off yeah. uh, accumulated yeah, f- yeah. from strikers. Think- and, 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 and this year yes, yeah, yeah. is the most for 20 years. Yes, yeah. And the reason for that is because of the actor's strike. Yes. And the last time, 20 years ago, yeah, it was yeah. so high, was because yeah. there was an actor's strike then as well. Yes. There's yeah, a lot yeah. of actors. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a lot of issues uh, involved there. The, the streaming industry has really messed with the uh, residuals model, the royalties uh, model. It's messed with the length of series dramatically. So basically there's a whole lot less job security. Although one of the biggest issues that emerged from that was that writers wanted some guarantee that their jobs wouldn't be reduced to rewriting shitty AI-generated scripts. Oh, yeah. Uh, But the studios did not want to guarantee that, although apparently (laughs) they have come to some agreement on that now. I don't know what it is. But regardless of all of these specific issues in each sector, the big issue underlying all of them is pretty simply that people's wages aren't keeping up with the cost of living. Mm. And especially in very expensive cities like uh, Los Angeles, even a lot of the cities around the Midwestern auto industry, which haven't always been considered high cost of living cities, are nonetheless getting too expensive for um, uh, for auto workers. There's a lot of stories about auto workers having to work second jobs in order to pay the rent, which, you know, traditionally that was not what an auto job Promised an auto job, promised stability. It promised a middle class lifestyle, uh, you know, for people without a college degree. Um, one of the things that they're really, really pissed off about is during the pandemic, auto companies got massive amounts of money from the government. They also um, introduced this tiered system of pay, which is still in place. Hang on, hang on. yeah, you said pandemic. You meant GFC. Um, no, no, this is the pandemic. They, okay. they got a huge amount of money during the GFC as well. Yeah, because the GFC. Okay, you keep yeah, going, yeah. and I'll, I'll add the GFC thing. Yeah, yeah, they the G- also the, got a lot the, during the GFC because the GFC is a big deal. Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. what happened during the GFC. Yeah, yeah. I think the the, the 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 beginnings of all this. Yes, anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. this tiered system of pay uh, was in place, which meant that you would well, the way that it's functioning at the moment is you basically got to be there for five or six years mm. before you start earning. Uh, in the top tier of pay. We're not talking about promotion. We're talking about this is a time-based uh, sort of tier system. Yeah. Um, and people are saying you need to, you basically need to be in the top tier to be able to, to um, make ends meet. Mm. So really it all comes back to um, wages not keeping up with cost of living. Now, what the car, actually talk about the GFC, okay, then okay. I'll say what the car companies yes. are saying now. Yes, okay, yes. All right, good, all right. Um, yeah, the, 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 like I said, this I think the genesis of this issue is from the GFC because yeah. essentially the car companies were where there were there were several times between 2007 and 2010 where they yeah. looked like they were about to go bankrupt. Yes, yeah. And the UAW, in uh, quite sensibly, agreed yes. to swallow a lot of shit to yes. keep those car companies yeah, alive. Absolutely, yes. Right? 
Um, so first of all, in 2007, they they had the first tiers. Yes. That's why I asked, yeah, yeah, yeah. are you trying the GFC? Ah, oh, right, right, right. The, um, in 2007, they, they established tiers for the first time. Yeah. So that starting pay for workers hired after 2007 would yep. be much lower yes, than yeah. they had previously been. Yeah. And then after a certain amount of time, they could increase their pay. Yes. They also accepted stingier health benefits for new workers yep. and they gave up health care in retirement. Yes. For new workers as well. Yeah, yeah. They also gave up defined benefit pensions for new workers yes. and accepted defined contribution pensions instead. So the difference there is regardless, defined benefit means you get paid a certain amount. No yep. matter what happens yes. to the economy, yep. defined contribution means they take out a certain amount of your paycheck and if the company, if the financial institution goes bankrupt, well, tough shit. Yeah. Right? The, uh, so, so basically, defined benefits means the car company is, is on the hook to pay, to pay your pension, no matter what happens to yes. the investment, so they could potentially pay a lot more. Yes, but um, the uh, this fine contribution means the company is not on the hook at all. They yes. just take your money out and just leave it. Right? Now I'm not sure what happened to that system in the interim, but a new tier system was put in place during the pandemic. So okay, it became. Sure. Workers hired after 2019. Yeah, got, okay. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, exactly what, the same what, thing what, Chaz was talking yeah, about. The same principles apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Yep. Then in, that was the first round of, of cuts that, mm. that the UAW accepted, negotiated yes. and accepted yeah, yeah, yeah. to keep the car companies alive. Then 2008 and 9, they went for another round of cuts. Yeah. They suspended automatic cost of living wage increases. Until then, as inflation went up, yep. their wages went up. Uh, they agreed to not strike for six years. Older workers, uh, there was a wave of buyouts where the, where older workers were encouraged by both the car company and the union mm. to take buyouts, which would allow car companies to replace them with the new cheaper workers yes. as well to make their their wages, yep. the overall labour uh, budget smaller. Yep. Uh, and uh, and so yeah, and so, so you had a situation where they they swallowed all this shit, and since then car companies have made massive profits. Yes. But the workers have gotten pretty much none of those sacrifices back. Yes, yeah, As yeah. Dave said, in the pandemic, they had another round of yep. this kind of stuff. Um, now, and their wages are worth way less than they were 20 years ago. Yes. Average real hour, uh, hourly earnings have fallen almost 20% since yeah, yeah. 2008 for their labor force. And that's largely because a lot of the older, expensive workers have re been replaced by cheaper workers. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so now the theory is it's time to pay up. Okay, so yes. so so that's the background I've got here. Yeah. Are you going to go through their demands or do you want me to go through their demands? Uh, you go through their demands. Okay, all right. Okay, so right now the first thing they want is paid time off. Yes. The second thing they want is a 32-hour week. Yep. Third thing is a 36% pay increase. Yes. For uh, At this point in time, Ford's proposed 20%, GM's proposed 18%, and Steins has proposed 17.5%. You might go, wow, 36%, that's ridiculous. But- 36 hmm. percent actually only just gets them up to where they were yes. in in the middle of the GFC yeah, yeah yeah like even before before then they were even better yeah but it's actually the least you could do to get them back to where they were yes yeah. when they had the, when they made their concessions yes um they want to restore cost of living increases unsurprisingly well I mean th if they hadn't got rid of the cost of living increases they would have got the 36 percent yes. increase yeah yeah already <coughs> They want to reinstate defined benefit pensions rather than defined contribution pensions. Mm -hmm. And they want the right to strike over plant closures as yes. well. Uh, and the car companies have so far rejected most of them. Um, uh, the, the car companies, however, have offered Juneteenth as a paid holiday. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and uh, we'll give Ford credit. They're offering two weeks of paid parental leave as well. That's something. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks. Anyway, the kid's ready now. Anyway, starting pay is currently eighteen dollars an hour. They, yeah. and, and like, and, and Dave was talking about how, you know, at one point in time, these guys were the royalty of the working class. Yeah, eighteen dollars an hour. That's target. Yes, right? like that's yeah. <laughs> that's that's not a good way. Less than target in yeah. many cases. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. And um, and that is. That number, 36 below where it would be in two thousand and seven, yes. if their staying wage had yeah, yeah. continued on, uh, if it kept up with inflation. Yes. And meanwhile, the pay packages for the big three's chief executives yes. have all risen forty percent over the past decade, and the profits have ri have risen ninety two percent since twenty thirteen. Yes. Um, and I'll just throw in one more thing here, which is the stock buybacks. Yeah. Since 2013, the companies have paid out nearly $66 billion in dividends and stock buybacks. Yes. $14 billion this year alone. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and one of the UAW's demands, which is an interesting one, is that the workers receive $2 in profit sharing for every million dollars the big three spend on stock buybacks and dividends, which would mean that each worker would gain $28,000 this year. Yeah. Anyway, take it away from there. Now, <laughs> the thing about being a publicly listed company is <laughs> it's hard to cry poor yes. because you're required to gloat to your shareholders <laughs> yes. about how much money you're yes. making, no matter yes. how bad a look it is when it comes to your workers. But... They do have a trick up their sleeve, which is to claim that the inevitable disruption that is coming with the electric vehicle transition means they can't afford any of this. Yes. Now, this is a pathetic <laughs> excuse, uh, an absolutely pathetic excuse. Um, of course, you know, this is the thing that Trump is seizing on. Mm. He's saying that, well, you know, what needs to be done to support the workers is to reverse the move towards electric vehicles. Um, this is, I mean, it's true that the UAW does want some protections from, you know, potential disruption to electric vehicles, but this is not actually the central issue. This is the central excuse mm. being made by auto companies. Mm. Um, and it's it's ridiculous. Mm. It, does, it does not hold water. Um, part of the thing about the development of electric vehicles in the United States is it's always been heavily, heavily backed by the government, mm. right? So the reason why Tesla didn't go bankrupt numerous times since 2008 was because California required car companies to be making a transition to electric vehicles. Those who were not doing it, though, could get out of it by paying credits to companies that were uh, committed to electric vehicles. So when Tesla's shitty, ugly death mobiles weren't uh, keeping it afloat, Credits from other companies were what uh, what kept it afloat numerous times. So the electric vehicle industry in the United States is really a baby of government intervention, like especially the uh, you know especially the California government. But uh, what Biden is doing, it, what the Biden administration is doing, is uh, you know promoting what is going to be a very very heavily government backed um, transition to electric vehicles. Um, this is. Not well. If it if it happens the way that uh, that Biden has it planned, this is not supposed to actually hurt workers, right? The, yeah. Go on. No, I was going to. I was going to say that the, what the unions are, are yes. arguing though is that yeah, yeah. is that it's not going to plan. What's happening? Yes, yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. This is, yes, is, is yeah, what yeah. you about to say. Uh, no, you go. Okay, on. Right. Yes, yeah. That these car companies are using the yes. the, the payouts from the government yes, to yeah, basically yeah. open up cheap non-union plants. That's right. Yes, yeah, to yeah. build batteries in the south, yes. essentially, and yes, and their right. operations are gradually moving from the north to the south. Yes, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that the unions are getting squeezed out, and the workers accordingly. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the when it comes to the union's issue with it, mm. that's what it's it, that's mm. what it is. It's mm. not so much the electric vehicle transition itself. Mm. It's the anti-union practices that companies mm. are actually engaging in mm. using electric vehicles uh, as an excuse mm. um, uh, to do it. I so, should say by the way that move has been happening even before electric vehicles. Oh yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it's been happening for a yeah. Yeah, but the last 30 it's, years, basically, the South's gone from having 15% of the auto industry industry to 30% of the auto industry, and Midwest has gone from 60% of the auto industry to 45% yes, of the auto yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of these southern states are right-to-work states. That yes. is, there's legislation there that prohibits the unions from collecting uh, mm -hmm. dues from non-union members, which basically mm -hmm. means no collective bargaining yeah. or no collective bargaining worth shit. So that's the real, that is the actual um, problem. As a little side, yes. you know that that... It's not like the Democrats weren't awake to that particular issue no. when, when they passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that there was supposed to be a four and a half thousand dollar tax credit yeah, yeah. for people who bought cars that were union made. Yes. Do you know what happened to that? No, what happened? Uh, there, there's, it got uh, it, 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 unfortunately it got uh, blocked by uh, guess who? Who? Joe Manchin. Ah, of course. <laughs> of course. So that's but, why that's not there. Yeah, to continue the earlier point, mm. right, so as you said, this has mm. been going on for a long time before electric vehicles. Mm. Even if the, the march towards electric vehicles was halted tomorrow, mm. even if we suddenly cut away all government yeah. support for electric vehicles, that is still the way that the car industry wants to go, mm. moving as much shit possible into 
non-union states. Yes. That, right. yes. that is the issue. Yes. And the thing is that the auto industry has always, you know, far before electric vehicles, has always been dependent on the government in various ways, even going mm. back to the fact that the massive federal highway network um, uh, that was built was a huge boon yep. for the, the auto industry in the United States, as is the chronic underinvestment in uh, in public transport. So mm. government intervention and the auto industry are massively tied up uh, together, the way that the government is particularly pushing it at the moment is towards electric vehicles. Um, but yeah, the the point is that even if that was stopped uh, in some way, these anti-union practices would still be you know continuing in various ways. The mm. electric vehicles are just the the vehicle for it at the moment. So today, I believe it was today, or it might have been yesterday. I think it was today though. Um, Trump was uh, sorry. Biden was actually he went to the picket line. Yes, yeah. I don't know what uh, happened in there. In Belleville, yeah. Michigan. Yeah. I think from what I could see, he talked for a couple of minutes yeah. about how the uh, auto companies are making huge profits and the workers should be seeing some of those profits. And he doesn't accept that they can't afford it. Then he handed the microphone back over to UAW leader Sean Fain, who spoke for like another twenty minutes. Sure. Uh, Sean Fain was recently elected. And I think won an upset election. There's all, all kinds of union... The, the strikes are happening when all kinds of union leaders are winning upset elections, like Fran Drescher mm. uh, <laughs> won an upset election. Um, is there yeah. any position of power that isn't being filled by some ex-actor at this point in time, no, or entertainer? No. Well, actually, <laughs> sure, Sean Fain is not one. But <laughs> Sean Fain has quite cannily so far withheld UAW support from Biden. So he will not endorse Biden. Uh, mm. for president yet. Mm. Now, he was not impressed by the Biden administration's approach to this, which was basically to do what they had tried to do to ward off strikes on the railroads and the docks, which was to send people to negotiate with both sides. They were deeply unimpressed when Trump, when uh, when Biden sent a couple of aides to talk to them. They're mm. like, no, fuck off. You send the president to the picket line or, or else, yeah. right? So Biden has gone to the picket line. Um, Trump's also going to... Not the, not the pickup line. Not, not the picket line. The picket line. No. He's going to Detroit. Now, this, by the way, is another example of something that pisses me off. His campaign said he was going to address striking workers. So all across the media, they mm. just credulously repeated, Trump yeah. is going to Michigan to address striking workers. Like, yeah. No, he's not because the UAW has made it clear he's not welcome anywhere near yes. a picket line. He is not yeah. going to address striking workers. He is going to Detroit to, last I heard, address a room of current and former union members. Ooh. That could be anything. Is it, is it even current? I thought I thought it's a non-union shop. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> like the actual the event is being organised by the Right to Work Foundation. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like yeah. That, that's like going to to support abortion by yeah, going yeah, yeah. going to the clinic and then joining the protesters. Yeah, yeah. So no, he's not <laughs> he's not a supporter of uh, unions, and you know they. The UAW keeps pointing out he was a very anti-Labor president, kept appointing judges who have made a lot of very anti-Labor rulings. So, sorry, sorry, I know you're about to move on, but yeah. I, I, just, I just had to add as well, yeah, it's yeah. not even an auto plant. It's no. a truck parts supply. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, go yeah. on. Yes. So basically Trump is positioning himself as pro-worker but anti-union. Mm. Uh, but he won't be so explicit about the anti-union part, but he's saying that oh, the UAW sold its membership down the river. They want to send your jobs to China, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Now, the whole pro-worker but anti-union thing, to you know, to give credit to Trump and the Republican Party, that has worked to them f- to for some extent. And mm. Part of the whole framing of it has been that the real threat to workers is environmental regulations mm. and that if you allow drilling and logging mm. everywhere yeah. uh, on all on all federal land, this is what gets the uh, you know this is what gets the blue collar uh, economy going. Mm. And yeah, he'll be saying that um, cutting away all the support for electric vehicles is going to do the same thing. Look, that that has worked to um, uh, you know to some extent. Mm. And I talked last week about this is all part of the nationalist protectionist bargain. You can add that's usually an anti-environmentalist mm. um, uh, bargain as well. Um, but, you know, we, we will see how well it works this time. Mm. You yeah. can, I mean, we should as well some context here that, yeah. that like, Trump's going to soft pedal his anti-union thing as hard as he yes, can because he unions yeah. are actually genuinely popular at the moment. Yeah, they are. Yes. Like, they got, like, 71% approval yes. according to Gallup. Yeah. I, Ipsos 
polled this strike. Yeah. 58% support from Americans, including 48% support for the strike by Republicans. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's genuinely popular. It is, yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, – so, yeah, I don't think he's going to push the anti-union thing too hard. No, no. <laughs> it's, um, uh, the other thing I would say about – this is not about, about Trump so much as um, – just going back to something you were talking about before when you're talking about the the uh, how the transition to electric vehicles is not the actual major problem. I mean, look, yeah. these companies are paying tens of billions of dollars as part of the transition, but they've got tens of billions of they dollars. They do, yeah, yes. So that, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that to Anya, and the, the bottom line is once they make that transition, yeah. there's still a lot of Americans buying cars yes. that will pay for it. Yes. Right. But anyway, but the, the, the concern seems to me – I mean, they're not, not that they're saying this. Yeah, yeah. But the, the the actual concern for them, to the car companies I'm talking about. Yeah, here, yeah. Seems to me, seems to me to be that they that when they're entering the electric car industry, they're competing against Tesla. Oh no. Who are non-union mm. and who really underpay workers. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Well, well. To be fair, yeah, it's not like they pay them terrible wages, but in terms of benefits. Yes. They don't get oh, any yes. benefits. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. They, the cost of labour is significantly less yeah, yeah. for Tesla than it is for, is for, the, for union labour. Yes, yeah. And so, and so yeah, I, I imagine car companies, and they're competing against either Tesla or Chinese cars. Yeah, yeah. Which presumably I also, think Chinese cars are actually the much bigger problem. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're presuming, Especially yeah. in the long term. Yeah. Yes. So like, so I, I imagine that, that that is their greatest concern. That yeah, at yeah. the moment they're in kind of a sheltered market. Yes, yeah. Like with the with the old style cars and the Americans buy American cars and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you when you uh yeah in the in the new in the new electric industry yeah, yeah. that they they might have less shelter in the yeah, yeah, yeah. in the competition that they're facing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they're worried that they that, uh, they they may be worried that yeah, if yeah. they load themselves up with too many labour costs, they won't be able to compete. Mm. I, I mean, do you think that's a legitimate concern or not? I can see that they're using it as an excuse. I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, I can I can see why. Um, mm. This would be dependent on uh, Tesla's meme stock remaining ridiculously uh, overinflated and mm. Musk not uh, not managing to crash it all. Which you know, I can I can see. Mm. Um, but no, the the much bigger long term concern is China. Yeah, yeah, yeah is uh, is competition from China. Yeah. Uh, do you have more thoughts about this? Because I've got a slight, I've got, I've got another thought about this area, but it's a slightly different area. Okay, now. yeah, okay, go for which it. is I want to talk about the Labor Secretary for a second. Yes, who is, uh, who is some, well, the acting Labor Secretary, yep. who is Julie Su. Mm-hmm. Um, President uh, President Biden's original pick was uh, was it Marty Marty Walsh? I think was uh, the original Labor Secretary. He resigned yep. some time ago, mm-hmm. and he wants Julie Su to be the replacement. Yeah. For some reason, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend I know. For some reason, yep. Mansion hates her, right? Yep. And Cinema hasn't said anything. Like, like in, in, she's she's maintained her sphinx-like state. Yeah. <laughs> but people are assuming that she doesn't support her. Otherwise, they would have yep. tried to pass her. Yes. Her confirmation. They've even tried to pass her confirmation. Mm-hmm. So she's been sitting there without confirmation for months and months and months, yep. which is fine. You're allowed to, under the Vacancies Reform Act, have a certain amount of period, yep. have a certain period of time. The thing that's that's interesting though yes. is that that time is about to ex- expire. Right, October ten, yes, it's going to yeah. expire, which could well be in the middle of this strike. Yeah, um, and they've made no effort whatsoever to get her confirmed right. in the in yeah. the six odd months that yeah, she's been yeah, sitting yeah. there, and she's about to expire. Yes. what they've said instead is that uh, she isn't being appointed. Uh, Labor Secretary under the usual rules. Mm. They said that they're using an obscure law that's different that says the acting Labor Secretary can continue on indefinitely. Right. Uh, and it, that law does exist. Yeah, so yeah. Then they're, not, they're not actually breaking the law. No. But it's really shit. It's, it's very like, shit. <laughs> like, like, honestly, like I, I hated all the acting appointments that Trump that Trump used, often yes. against explicitly the law. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I and I just like if you can't either get it confirmed or get someone else. Like if yeah. you if you can't get it confirmed with Mansion, then fine. Get someone like no one's irreplaceable. Nobody <laughs> that's, is irreplaceable. That's my theme from the beginning of the yes. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just yeah, I hate presidents bypassing the Senate to have these shadow acting secretaries. Yeah. Um the 
like if, if if this becomes a thing where just yeah. where just everyone starts doing this all the time, then it completely eliminates any kind of accountability. Yeah. And, and the the inevitable solution, the inevitable result will be just centralizing more power in the president. Yes, yeah. which America's got enough of that already. Yeah. You know? And so uh, anyway, so I just want to just, just note that because it doesn't get much yes. coverage. Yeah. That's kind of shit. Yeah, it is. And very I, shit. I wish they would stop that. Yes. Um. I won't start the social media court case because it's because no. we, we we've already done an hour uh, two hours ten so yeah. <laughs> that's probably enough. Um, do you have anything else you want to say? I have one more update. Yes, please. Or maybe we should call it an up hate. Oh, this is someone you're not grateful for because well, <laughs> okay. Yes. So I'd like to apologise to everyone who might have heard me talking about Coach Prime. Time oh, yes. last week. Dion oh, Sanders yes. heard me talking about him and thought, this guy sounds awesome. I want to <laughs> live my life according to his teachings. I watched one of his press conferences because of you. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, things have hit a little bit of a snag. Okay, so in the form of the University of Oregon, which so they're the Ducks, by yeah. the way. Ah. So they, the Colorado had so far played the Texas Christian University Horned Frogs, yep. the Nebraska Corn Huskers, and the Colorado State Rams. Yep. Last week they were up against the Oregon Ducks. Now, Oregon has been very good for about 15 years, mm. and they play in one of the most loud and hostile stadiums in the United States. It's Phil Is- Knight from Nike's alma mater, so he's poured zillions of dollars. So into they call it the Duck Pond? The, uh, no, they don't. They, call, <laughs> they try to call it something more intimidating. But anyway, <laughs> the point is Oregon's very good. Mm. And uh, Oregon coach Dan Lanning, mm. right? So, you know, these days everyone is basically required to do some hate talk uh, <laughs> before before the game. Yeah. And so he was talking to uh, his players and it was, it was pretty hateful. He mm-hmm. basically implied that Colorado was just a social media outfit. He said, mm-hmm. men, they're fighting for clicks. We're fighting for wins. Ooh. Ooh hate. Fighting words. Ah, uh, yes, but unfortunately, unlike everyone else so far, <laughs> he was actually able to back it up. Oh, dear. Oregon won 46 to 6. Oh. And uh, I got to say, like, there would have been millions of Americans basically fantasizing about this moment mm. and about what they would say to Coach Prime <laughs> after an inflicting and a defeat like that on him. And I've got to say, yeah. nothing that anyone could have fantasized about was as good as what Dan Lanning actually came up with. We were prepared for a battle, it didn't end up being a battle. How cold is that? Oh. Now, Coach Prime did have something to say about it. Concision isn't really his thing. So <laughs> this is what he said. People around the country will say this is what they needed to humble themselves, Colorado coach Deion Sanders said. We wasn't arrogant or whatever. We're confident people. Our confidence offends your insecurity. That's a problem with you. It's not us. Just bear in mind, his team has just Just lost lost. 46 to 6. (laughs) We expect to do well. We expect to play well. We expect to win every game. It's not something that was needed. That's like saying you get in a car wreck or something and saying, oh, you needed that. You didn't need that. That's just stupid. It's just something that happened. They got the best of us today. That's just it. I think Lanning wins this round. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a col- uh, Oregon was ranked 10 in the country at, this, at that point. They, their ranking will increase. But next week, uh, Colorado plays University of Southern California, who are ranked five coming into this. So it, it's going to get harder yeah. uh, for, for Coach Prime. But anyway, that's your up hate uh, <laughs> of, of the week. I leave leave you with a question time, very quick one yes. from James. What happened to the hand of God? Oh. Is he still lurking there quietly or onto bigger things? Been mean to ask for ages. Yes. Well, he is not he doesn't work on Plain America anymore. He has moved on to bigger things. He's actually his own boss now. He works at yeah. SBS and his name's John Schmidt and he's uh he's um I asked him permission to use his name. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he said it was okay. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, 
and he's uh yeah and he yeah he's moved to SBS and he's he's got his guy's own little editing team now and Great. He's, he's very successful awesome. and and rightly so absolutely rightly so because he's fantastic yes he was always destined for bigger and better things than looking after us I would like to think yes <laughs> yes so we're very podcast. very glad to see it and he's yeah. only going to go on to bigger and better things yeah so keep an eye out for him because he is he is a gun and he is fantastic. absolutely so yes. there you go so that is the the story of the hand of God uh, I will see you guys in a week's time next Wednesday. That's right. Uh, I will see you guys next Friday. Yes. Not this Friday, next Friday. Next Friday. All right. Stay peppy. See ya.